We will trust God's word alone, where His perfect will is known. Our traditions shift like sand, while His truth forever stands. We will live by faith alone, clothed in merit, not our own. All we claim is Jesus Christ and His finished sacrifice. Glory be, glory be to God alone. Through the church He redeemed and made His own. He has freed us, He will keep us till we're safely home. Glory be, glory be to God alone. Post Tenebras Lux. After darkness, light. Well, it is good to be back. It's good to be on tonight. I hope you are excited for this show. I'm always excited about this topic, and I'm also excited that I'm doing it with my guest, the apologetic dog. Yes, that was quick. <laughs> I'm Anthony. sure you expected, you expected me to give a much longer intro, but no, not that's so. Awesome. Not so. <laughs> I wish I could have turned on the lights on my side as well, just to out of the darkness light coming in. For those that don't know, I was talking to Jeremiah. His name is Jeremiah. And I think you say your last name, Nortier, right? Mm. Nailed it. Or, yeah, okay. So I, I think I've heard people say Nortier, and I'm I'm inclined to say that only because Hillary of Potier, his name is spelt almost the same as yours, uh, at least the last several letters, mm -hmm. with the exception of an S. Uh, but, uh, I, yeah, you're, so you're in the South and I guess, uh, as a result that of that swing going on down here. Yeah. Yeah. So for those that don't know, I'm going to let him introduce himself to you other mm -hmm. than, uh, for me, I'll say, uh, I've enjoyed watching stuff from Jeremiah. Uh, he gets the privilege of being my first full guest. I did have a show the other day where I invited some people up to ask questions, make comments, but this is the first time that I'm actually having a guest on. I'm a little, a little apprehensive about this because I don't know that I have the skill to really officiate something like this. I'm used to doing things on my own. I, I think in this sense, I'm, I'm kind of a, a YouTube interview bachelor. I mean, uh, I don't know <laughs> if that makes sense, but uh, I'm not a bachelor in life, right? I have a wife and four kids, but, but uh, as far as this goes, I'm used to doing it on my own, you know, so Four I, I kids. Probably, I don't know how you even fit your YouTube stuff in with that schedule. Well, my kids are, you know, older now. Uh, my youngest is 16. So, oh, wow. yeah. So, uh, Anthony, uh, I have one boy who's five months old. So months. I'm new to the whole parenting thing. Wow. Okay. Well, congrats on that. Congrats. Uh, for those that don't know, Jeremiah and I not only... Uh, share a love for this topic, but as his name indicates, he's interested in apologetics, and that includes then defending this doctrine. Mm -hmm. And he and I both debated the topic, or at least uh, the general topic, in, in different ways. You know, there, there were different specifics in, in terms of what we were doing. Uh, he was debating specifically the question of justification in relation to water baptism over against a advocate of church of christ doctrine and i was debating an eastern orthodox individual so two very different uh, groups of people two very different ways of denying the doctrine of god's free grace in christ and, and justification solely through faith in him and his active and passive obedience but uh, nevertheless same doctrine we were defending anyways jeremiah why don't you tell people about yourself since i'd probably do an inadequate job other than no. to say uh, hey, he's a brother. 
<laughs> yes, and it's an honor to be your first guest here on. Uh, I've watched your channel, so I was listening to you talk a second ago. I was like, oh yeah, I'm he I'm here with Anthony as well. So thank you for having me. Um, I serve as a pastor and elder at Twelve Five Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas. That's Northeast Arkansas. So I always just want to lead with that to tell people if you're anywhere close in the area, come search us out. Uh, we have a church website. Uh, it's pretty easy to find us, and we'd love for you to come participate in our fellowship. And so I do that. <clears throat> I have a day job also as a hospice chaplain and bereavement coordinator. And so I'm doing a lot of visits throughout the day. And Anthony, it's so amazing to be able to talk about this gospel of grace with people that are going through hard times of life, um, whether they're about to reach the end of life or I'm dealing with families that um, have lost a loved one. And so I get to comfort them with God's truth and a peace that surpasses um, anything that this world has to offer. So my heart is blessed being able to do that. And so my church family has come around me to really support uh, my endeavors in apologetics. And so the apologetic dog was born out of that. And my wife and I, we were trying to think of a name and a logo. And it was so funny, Anthony, because she was just like, Doctrines of Grace, dog. And I was like, yes, I like it. But I want it to be broader than just the Doctrines of Grace. And, um, and I was praying about a verse to really ground the ministry because we all know First uh, Peter 3.15 is wonderful for apologetics. But the more I was reading Greg Bonson, hopefully you'll like this, I came across First Timothy 6.20 where Paul is saying, oh, Timothy, guard the deposit that's been entrusted to you. And so right there, I knew it needed to be a guard dog, meaning that all Christians are to guard the gospel of grace. And we do this by avoiding irreverent babble pagan philosophy that tries to rival the knowledge of God and actually asserts contradictions that falsely, uh, you know, have internal contradictions. And I was like, oh, I'm already thinking presuppositionally. Um, you and I have a, a mutual friend, Eli Yala, who's just enriched my heart and life um, with his ministry and his teaching. And so um, the apologetic dog is um, rooted in apologetics, Trinitarian, Reformed, gospel of grace and so i'm just telling people i want to be broad but i also have a few areas of emphasis and so one of the things in jonesboro arkansas my local area is there's the church of christ all over the place and they hold to a different gospel they believe that participating in the ceremony of water baptism um, is essential and necessary in order for us to be made right with god and so um, i've been able to um, have a lot of opportunities to talk about the gospel in light of this gospel that really says, hey, well, you have to do something, right? We don't like calling it works, but read Acts 2.38. That didn't just stand there. And so I've been able to really shed some light on context and things like that. Um, but Anthony, that's a little bit about me and my local context. Yeah, thank you so much. So there's uh, a good bit of overlap. I actually think the ministry that you do when you talk about reaching out to people in, in the context of bereavement and so forth is very similar in some ways to what I do in terms of my primary vocation. You know, I do prison ministry and, you know, I go into the prisons. It's like going into hospitals in some ways. And, uh, you know, the, it's, there's a lot of difficulties associated with both of these contexts. But, you know, one thing is for people in prison is they've been yanked away from their loved ones. Mm. And sometimes there's, stuff that happens on the outside for a prisoner and he can't do anything about it. He can't, you know, they feel helpless. Uh, so anyways, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different areas of overlap between these two things. Uh, and of course the gospel is the great balm for all of that. You know, the, the gospel is the answer. I mean, mm. you know, it, I, I, it, it, to me, it, I, I often, what gets me a lot when I think about this issue and people opposing it and the very fact that we have to defend it is I think, why, you know, why are people kicking against this? Sometimes, you know, people have looked at, and I don't know if you've noticed some of this, I know you've gotten some of this, but I don't know if you've noticed some of the backlash I've gotten from people. I've had people make all sorts of slanderous statements against me, just un godly oh, yeah. stuff and i don't spend as much time trying to put out all those fires i think that's fine you know it is what it is i, I kind of think like david where he said you know of shimei mm -hmm. god has bidden him to curse right let him curse and but, I've, uh, I've also heard of you quote uh, i believe it's spurgeon it's like is that all 
bad things you have to say about me because I'm a lot worse than what you're actually accusing me of. I didn't know Spurgeon said that, but uh, I'm I'm glad to know that. Uh, you know, good minds think alike, or at least <laughs> my mind yes. thinks like one good mind, at least. Uh, but I also say, Anthony, real quick, um, I I'm a small YouTube channel, so when I look up to you. I'm just like, man, I'm so glad people are supporting his ministry. Uh, I'm glad you're getting up late at night to go deep into the the trenches of truth. And so I just want to encourage the audience. I'm actually on a race to a thousand subscribers um, with a Mormon friend that I have, uh, Robert Boylan. (laughs) And so we have a little bit of stake in the game. So if you can help me out, I am, I'm closely approaching one K subs and I'm pumped. I I should have said something. I I told you I'm new at this as far as having someone on. Plus I don't even tell people to subscribe to my own channel. That's probably that's, that's probably why you get so many subs is people are like, man, this dude is so real. I, I just think you know I, I've watched people sometimes saying subscribe and then I watch their uh, the subs you know the or I, or they'll say like my video and I watch and I'm thinking nobody actually presses the like button when, <laughs> when people are pressing them to to press the like button. Right. So it's like uh, you know we all hear it and nobody does it. So I'm just going to leave it and let it be what it is. Love it. But uh, not to criticize anybody who does it. You know, it's just I think. Uh, but anyways, what I'm getting at is sometimes people will ask. I get comments all the time. People will send me comments through Facebook, through YouTube, through all these different venues. And they'll say, you know, this person said this about you. This person said that. And they're upset for me. Right. Mm. And I, I appreciate that. It, it means a lot to me that uh, I have a place in people's hearts that they're concerned about these lies and these slanders and so forth. You got, you got thick skin, though. I've well, but, but there's a couple of things, you know, it's. Thick skin, and and part of it has to do with my own background, which I believe was God-directed. Maybe we can come back and talk about some of that. But the other thing is just the gospel. My Mm. my great concern is how does it stand between my soul and God? Mm. I'm almost 50 years old, and I've been thinking this way for almost, you know, for, well, for about 30 years. And... I don't think I have the same amount of time left. I don't know. I mean, it's in God's <laughs> hands. But at the end of the day, when I die, it's not going to matter what sorts of things were said about me. I'm going to stand before my Lord, and that's going to be what matters, is, mm. is what, what that event will mean. And I'm not going to be embarrassed when I stand there that day, because I know I'm standing there clothed in his righteousness. I'm mm-hmm. standing there. I'm going to stand there clothed in the righteousness of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And so when I think of what God thinks of me, I think of the fact that he thinks of me as his son because I'm in his son. He thinks of me as beloved because I'm in the beloved. He mm. thinks of me as righteous because I'm in the righteous one. And on and on I could go with the different epithets and so the point that i'm making with this is i don't understand why people want to oppose this gospel when it's so full of comfort i've given Mm. only one example of the kind of comfort one can derive from this imagine being able to walk through a crowd of people hurling insults at you and not once have to feel like you're ashamed or have to hang your head or lose a a bit of of peace or whatever. Mm. I mean, that's how I feel every single day. And then I look at these people who are opposing this gospel, who they they wake up virtually every day despondent. They walk Mm. around like schlep rock, like the sky is falling. Or even if that's not their every waking moment, it intrudes upon their thoughts often enough. There's just, it seems to me like these people are fighting against, not just seems, I know it as a matter of fact, they're fighting against that thing that uh, will grant them peace, will grant them comfort. If you have peace with God, you could have peace in the midst of whatever storm is out there. Anthony, you've you've been a wonderful role model um, because stepping into the apologetic sphere, um, I've slowly had to be able to process criticism. Um, probably one of the biggest pieces of criticism was over a year and a half ago or so. I went on the Gospel Truth with Marlon. Definitely want to encourage people to go over there. That's where they saw your debate. That's where I've had tons of debate. And I was the first live in-person debate on Marlon's channel. We flew him out from California down to the South, baby. We had a blast. (laughs) But I debated the question, is Mary sinless or was Mary sinless? And obviously I'm like, no, she's a sinner saved by grace. And so William Albrecht came at me guns a blazing. And so that was the <laughs> first time I've ever had been in someone's crosshairs and felt it. 
but honestly, Anthony was so good because I just, I kind of was like, you know what, Lord, you're going to have to preserve my heart and feelings. My wife was listening to the things he was saying. She kept looking at him. I was like, we can't stop it. <laughs> so, uh, but like you said, my heart goes to the God who saved me and he has to preserve me. Right. And he's not going to he's not going to stop what he started. Right? He's going to see it to completion. So I've looked to your um, guidance and your example a lot. And I just want to thank you a lot for your ministry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, that, and that's one of the things I'm also it, it, I sometimes mention it just in case people miss it. But I'm always hoping it comes through. It, it's kind of like I may not necessarily focus on the fact that scripture is the word of God, it's usually a, a, an assumption of all that I'm doing, right? It's, it's assumed mm -hmm. in what I'm doing when I ex, exegete the word. But I'm often thinking implicitly, I hope people see something of the beauty of scripture in the course of what I'm saying mm -hmm. and see something of the basis for believing it to be the inspired word of God, even if that's not my direct focus at the time, right? So for mm -hmm. example, if I'm talking about how Christ is set forth in Scripture in promise and fulfillment, you know, typologically and in reality. I may not be trying to make an argument for the inspiration of Scripture and right. so forth, but I'm hoping that people are, through seeing Christ in Scripture, also at the same time having communicated to them this fact. Well, similarly, when I'm defending the gospel of justification, I'm hoping people are seeing something of the mm. fruits of it. A lot of people like to slander justification by faith, as though it promotes godlessness, as though it promotes uh, licentiousness. And I think to myself, how in the world could this gospel, which strikes at the, the root of all sin, be itself a promotion of sin? And, right. and what I mean by that, and you, you may have heard me mention this, but to take one example, if the gospel is tells us that to God alone belongs the glory in salvation, inclusive of justification, because salvation is a bigger package than just justification. But if, if justification is by God's free grace, wholly apart from our works, and received solely through God-given faith, inwrought by the Spirit, then how could such a person be proud? On what grounds? On what grounds could I be proud and, and think that I somehow have a right to look down my nose at other people, right? How could I, knowing that the, the very thing that was necessary to reclaim me for God and put me on a right standing with him was the very death of his son, his eternal son, the object of all his affection, right? And he gave him for me. How could I think then that I have a right to turn my nose down at somebody else mm. and, you know, be haughty towards them. Uh, I, I, I can certainly disagree with their right. lifestyle if they're not living for Christ. I could disagree with all sorts of things. But the criteria for that is the same criteria that condemns me apart mm. from Christ. Right. But so I'm just saying, how could this gospel be considered the license for sin if, if that's the case? And I've heard you bring out that paradigm that Jesus taught about in Luke 18 with the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the pushback I get from the church of Christ is, well, that Pharisee, he was under the works of law. He's not talking about commands of obedience that Christians are to obey. I'm like, you've missed the substance of what, what this man is boasting in his accomplishments, the things that he has done. But look at, uh, look at the tax collector. This is somebody who is pleading for the mercy of God for him to make atonement on his behalf, right? He understands his wretchedness and he needs God to save him out of the quarry, right? How Isaiah says of, of Abraham. So I'm with you. I'm like, you know, how could we look at anything good in ourselves? It's like, no, I was a wretch and God saved me by his amazing grace. Yeah. You know, that story, what I usually hear when that is brought up is the Pharisee was looking to his own efforts and not to the grace of God in him, helping mm. him to do good works unto justification. So you mentioned those who say, oh, well, he's just you know looking to works of law or that yep. sort of thing. Uh, but the, the way that Roman Catholics, for example, will go about this is to say, well, we believe that it's works done by the grace of God. But notice carefully how the, the Pharisee, maybe you're already thinking this, uh, but the, the Pharisee says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like he, speaking of the tax collector. 
the Pharisee didn't deny the grace of God. He didn't right. deny that God was there aiding him, assisting him, coming alongside him. You know, he didn't deny synergy, which is a watchword mm. of Eastern mm. Orthodoxy in the context of justification. In fact, that's the very thing he was affirming. I thank you, God, that I'm not like that man. Mm. And it was then on the basis of works that he believed he performed by the grace of God, setting him apart, making him distinct and so forth. It was on that basis that he thought he was right before God. The fair, And I, the other thing I love about that story is the literal translation there when the tax collector declaims any righteousness of his own as the grounds of his confidence before God. When he says, have mercy on me, the sinner, he's literally saying, make atonement for right. me. Make atonement for me, the sinner. So he's he's looking away from himself and he's looking for an atonement sufficient to cover his sin. And he's looking to God as the provider of that atonement. And that's the heart of, of justification and of a loose gospel and so forth. OK, so we've kind of we said all sorts of uh, good things, I think, about this topic. Uh, maybe what we could do. In uh, sort of running through this is, is is talk about well, one of the things that I wanted to talk about. And we can make contact uh, between these things and mm -hmm. our debates if you want, or just talk about the issues, uh, or both. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one of the first things that I want to talk about is the whole issue of the nature and character of God, because it, you know when I when I did my recent debate, and it's something I think about when it comes to doing any other debate on this topic. But you always have to decide, you know, how much time do I have for this or that? You might have to right. leave things out. It's an unfortunate fact of debate, you know, but everybody is shackled, right, by time constraints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but one of the assumptions, at least that I'm working on when I enter into a discussion like this, is that the God that we're talking about is holy, righteous, and just. Mm. And it, it seems to me that errant notions of justification often lose sight of this or don't sufficiently understand what scripture teaches along these lines. And so uh, what I'm thinking of here is the, the, the fact that scripture teaches that the, that the God with whom we have to do is the kind of being who is absolute perfection of mm -hmm. being, right? He is absolutely perfect holy, set apart from sin, so much so, and, and I always marvel at this, you know, people will mention Isaiah 6 and how Isaiah speaks of being undone, and that is where this is going, but, uh, and it's not a one-off, that sort of thing is seen many times in scripture, but what I marvel at and that people often miss is the fact that the unfallen angels in that context, mm -hmm. the holy angels, according to scripture, or at least the seraphim, if somebody wants to be technical, you know, some will make distinctions between uh, orders of being among the heavenly hierarchy and all that. But in any case, these heavenly beings who are unfallen, who sing God's praise day and night, that's their function, that's their purpose for being. It says they cover their own mm -hmm. eyes in the presence of God, whom Scripture says, you, you quoted 1 Timothy 6 uh, earlier in that same context, it mentions uh, God dwelling in unapproachable light, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I marvel at those who think of attaining justification before such a God when we're not unfallen angels, we are fallen sinners. So if you know, you, you've got this picture of these, and, and part of what I'm thinking of here is that there's a difference between the uncreated holiness of God and the created holiness of creatures. Creatures, their holiness depends upon God, right? God's holiness is independent. It's underived. It's immutable. God can't cease being holy. The, the angels could, if it were God's will to remove, with, withdraw from them, they could have fallen just like the other angels uh, that fell, right, with Satan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm just driving at this idea that the God of Scripture is absolute holiness, absolute purity, absolute righteousness, absolute mm -hmm. justice. He can't accept from sinners anything less than perfection without denying himself. Right. So I, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Because 
in preparation for the debate, I think you're going to appreciate this too and probably had a lot of similar thoughts. Not only do we want to put God in the highest esteem, he's all that is good and perfect, but he is the judge of all the earth who will do right. So in preparation for, so for on my side of things, the, 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 the propositional question that I debated and took the negative was, it, uh, is water baptism necessary for our justification before God? And so a big part of this is saying, what is justification? What does justification look like for us before God, who is holy, righteous, and good? And what does that look like for God to be judged? Well, the big clue is this is judicial, legal, forensic language. And I personally think if, if somebody reads the book of Romans and agrees that it's legal, then the debate's over. Like, like that's what we were really trying to grasp to say. And we are justified on the basis of faith apart from works of law. Any works that you could possibly do and bring to the table, those things aren't going to make you right before God. Abraham is the precipium um, lead example in that, but it's by faith. And so I really try to say, look, justification is judicial. And help me out here. Um, I believe Roman Catholics have tapped into that and realized that they can't make it judicial, at least in the way that we're trying to set it up, because they are trying to marry justification and sanctification to be elongated, right? Um, that it can be, you know, waned and lost over time. And then it seems like there's, uh, and you got to have that um, infused righteousness over time to kind of go back in the grace of God um, when you fall out. Um, awful. I don't see how you can have assurance of salvation. I mean, you can't. Um, I've listened to Dr. James White ask the question, who is the blessed man? And Roman Catholics are like, I don't know. I, I would hope to be the blessed man one day. And it's like, look, it's the person who's, whose sin is not imputed on their account. Not now and not ever. And so, um, Anthony, I brought that out in my debate. And the mm. gentleman that I debated, I have a lot of respect for, but I could tell there was a few times he was not tracking with Paul's argument in Romans 4. So that was some debate strategy on my part that I really wanted to go to Romans 4 and stay in the immediate context, allow Paul's argument to build on itself. Yeah, and so since y you mentioned several things there, it's hard to pick out one, but uh, <laughs> I'll run with this. In, in Romans, the lead up to Paul's discussion towards the tail end of Romans 3 on into mm. 4 through 5 and so forth, the lead up is talking about how the righteous wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What, what Paul is doing is he's he's set up in, in his thesis statement, Romans 1, 16 and 17, mm. Uh, he set up what the gospel is that he's going to talk about, but before he gets to unpacking that thesis statement, he's he sets up the the quandary, the, the problem that's created by the fact that God is righteous and man is a sinful truth suppressor mm. who deserves God's wrath. And so he begins in 118 saying, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And he goes on to talk about the fact that men are culpable in, in their sinfulness because they're not sinning in ignorance. They're sinning in the light of God's mm. clearly revealed truth. He has yeah. revealed himself and his righteous requirements through the things that he's made, as well as in the, the very uh, internal constitution of man. We are image bearers, and by virtue of that, are creatures. And since all created things reveal the creator, our own constitution reveals him. So we, mm -hmm. you're, you know, I love this. I, I think of the, you know, even the blind person can't escape a revelation right. of God because his own being cries out that God exists. And so this is the context in which we're sinning. And so Paul says the whole world, not just Jews, but the whole world is guilty of sin. And the Jews don't get off either. Paul goes on in Romans 2 to talk about how the Jews are guilty and how even Gentiles sometimes put Jews to shame for doing things that the law requires that they don't have in written form. Uh, and, and this is what gives rise to Paul's summary statement in Romans 3 where he says, and again, I mean, this is this is an example of, uh, uh, well, I just read the, the text. This is his summary statement. Uh, in verse 19, he says, We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world become mm -hmm. accountable to God. And th the Greek here is especially, I think, 
uh, interesting because what it literally says is all men are answerable to God, but the, the law has shut their mouths. Right. So so their mouths are shut and they have to speak, but they can't. Right. That's that's the upshot. And this is all legal language, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole idea of having to, to give an account. But then it goes on. It says, because by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now, this connects to what I was asking about God's character, because the law is a transcription of God's character. It, it's a reflection of what God is or is like. And therefore, it, it's telling us what we as his image bearers are supposed to be like. Right. Uh, uh, in Scripture, it says things like be holy as I am holy, be perfect as I am perfect. And so the law is that transcription. It's showing us what his holiness and perfection looks like in, in the case of men, you know, how men are supposed to reflect that. But but through the law, we're not being told what we actually are. Right. The law is exposing what we're not, how we fall short of God's glory. And so when you think about then the character of God and the law of God, how could you possibly think that you're going to be justified before that God on the basis of your own law keeping, especially now that you're a sinner? So with the Church of Christ, um, and I'm trying to be super charitable in this, uh, but it really gets me going because I think they are a part of the modern day Pharisees of legalism. And all the commandments that they say that they're doing to obey God. So like a big word in the church of Christ world is obedience or obey. You got to obey the gospel. And when you look at Acts 2, see, they didn't just stand there and do nothing. Um, It's like, of course not. But with what their immediate objection is with Paul's argument in Romans building up to chapter four here is this is Anthony. This is talking about works of the law. This is talking about a time um, before we exist here. And so they're saying, of course, we're not justified by works of law. So they really are going to key in to works of law, um, Romans 3, 28 or Galatians 2, 16. They're going to say works of law. And so in my debate, and I'm pretty sure I got this from you talking with Tony Costa a while back, and I loved it because it's like, okay, how can we we set up a statement that everybody's going to understand here. So I, I wrote a few out and I, I landed on one. I want your thoughts on this. I wrote and I asked the question to the individual. I said, I want you to hear the logic of the statement that I'm making. I have a question with it. Jesus is the son of God and he is not the son of Baal. And so the question was, since Jesus is not the son of Baal, could he potentially be the son of Ashtaroth or Ra or something? He's like, well, of course not. And I said, why? I said, is it because of the positive affirmation? And he was like, where are you going with this? And I'm like, look, we're justified by faith and not by works of law or any other works that you could you know, conjure up in your mind. That's not going to make you right before God. And so there's deeper issues going on here. Um, in their mind, we're not justified by human works. And what that means are things that we do that God does not prescribe. But if you do something in obedience to God, then they cloak this under the umbrella. Well, that's a work of God. And I'm over here like, wait, the works of God are the things that God does, right? Um, Human works, human effort, that's all encompassing. Now, we are created unto good works in obedience to what God has called us to. Um, So what I was just wanting to say is there is such a language barrier. Uh, We're using all the same terminology but mean different things by when we use it. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a confusion there. If they're trying to tie this to any biblical statement that says something like the work of God, like John six, the work of God is this, right? You believe in him whom he sent. They're understanding it uh, objectively rather than subjectively. And what that means is the work of God, meaning that the work that we do that God prescribes, right? As opposed to the work that God does Mm -hmm. either in us or for us or what have you. That's interesting. So my experience is not as much with the Church of Christ, though I have had mm-hmm. uh, a few run-ins with those who are or would uh, identify with uh, the Church of Christ. I used to live in Las Vegas. Uh, far more often, if we're thinking of restorationist groups, mm-hmm. I ran into Mormons, LDS mm-hmm. uh, people. Uh, you know, uh, for those that don't know, there during the 1800s, there was a whole movement a foot that gave rise to all sorts of cult groups, the 
Latter Day Saints, Day, Mormon Day Adventist are part Seventh of that. Day. Yeah, the Adventist movement, the Millerites, the Millennial Donists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, that whole period of time spawned this. And so I was used to at least some mm -hmm. offshoots of that movement, at least. Uh, well, now, Anthony, you're going to get more since I've come on your show. <laughs> I, they, they follow me wherever I go, it <laughs> seems like. Oh, you know, you say that. It reminds me of speaking of another cultic group. It I, I always reminded of uh, whenever I hear that statement, they follow me. The, uh, <laughs> Louis Farrakhan, I, I used to also deal with people who are members of the Nation of Islam. And I remember one time listening to Louis Farrakhan. He was entertaining, if nothing else. Uh, he, he, <laughs> but anyways, he, he was trying to say that there's this great big mothership. Mm. Because in, in the thinking of the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan, you all realize this is very relevant to justification, right? <laughs> no, no, this isn't a side, but I think you guys will find it somewhat funny. But uh, Louis Farrakhan believes that there are numerous embodied gods, just like in Mormonism and that sort of thing. And so it's entirely consistent with that to think of these gods in the way you might think of interplanetary travelers, astronauts or what have you, who are in spaceships. And he, he mentions that there's this mothership that, that follows him around and keeps track of him. And he says that's what's going on in Ezekiel 1 when it talks about a wheel with eyes all around, right? That Anybody reading the text is not actually going to get that idea. It, it's describing a throne chariot and all this. But anyways, uh, but, but Farrakhan says, it follows me everywhere I go. <laughs> I, for some reason that sticks in my head anyway it, it's true though <laughs> so they follow you everywhere you go all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna pick and, up some of your yeah yeah you, they'll they'll start following you too so they can just join the long line following anthony rogers um uh, and so with these groups that i just unashamedly say that have wholesale grabbed into works righteousness one of the best ways that I've found to really pick apart, because they, like they said, they're they're kind of the radical dispensationalists. Well, we're not under law anymore. That's the that's the law of Moses. We're living in a time post that. And so, <clears throat> it's like okay, let's go back to Abraham, right? Because he's the lead example. And yes, Romans one through three is talking about the Jews and the works of law. But then there's a subtle shift in Romans 4, when it talks about in verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works. Now, I want your thoughts on this, because I've just said, look, I don't think this could be talking about works of law with Abraham because he precedes the law by 600 years plus. Now, it's going to be super apparent in the Jews' mind. Well, of course, Abraham would have had to be justified apart from works of law because of the time period he lived. And so one of the one of the immediate questions I asked my interlocutor a few weeks ago was what works is Paul referring to with Abraham here? He immediately said, every time you see works in Romans, it's more than likely going to be referring to works of the law when you go back into Romans 3, uh, 20. Okay. And I said, okay, help me out because of who Abraham is. And he said, well, I think it would you just still drive the point home even more. And so I said, okay. And this goes back to what you just said a second ago. Think about Abraham. We need somebody who is an example of faith, someone that has a living faith or an obedient faith. The Church of Christ like that term, obedient faith, right? Because you got to think in their mind, James 2, a particular interpretation is floating around in there. But I said, look with me at verse 11, because Paul um, is referring to Abraham um, being the father of faith to all who believe, whether the circumcised or uncircumcised. So how does Paul's argument begin by making an appeal that's going to be in a category that's really only relevant to the Jews rather than a transcendent category where both parties can look to him as an example? And so I got the ball rolling with that, Anthony, because I said, look, the works that Abraham did precedes work of law. Right. In the immediate context, it's probably talking about the work of circumcision. Right. That was in Genesis uh, 17. But we should also have in our mind the works of Genesis 22, where he offered up his son, Isaac. And if you read Hebrews 11, then Genesis 12, he left the land of Ur. And my big point to him was none of his works, none of his ergon, none of his human accomplishments grounded his justification. Verse two says before God. 
And so, Anthony, I had that. That's how I got to start my cross examination, and it was awesome. <laughs> oh, so by the way, real quick, so where can people find that debate? I should put a link yes. to this in the description yes. box, but it's on. It's on okay. Donnie's channel, Standing for Truth. Um, and I just want to say I love Donnie's channel, Standing for Truth, and Marlon's channel, The Gospel Truth. Those are two um, wonderful debate platforms, two charitable men, moderators. Um, love both of those men dearly. And you've been on you've been on both. Have you been on Standing for Truth? I feel like yeah, you yeah. debated. Was it? Did you debate Turbyville on that one? Um, I can't remember where I've debated who. <laughs> I don't think it was there. Um, but it, it could have been. It might have been on Marlon's channel. I, I've been. Oh no. So with Donnie, I've done a talk on the Trinity, and oh, in fact, yeah, I'll yeah, be going yeah. back on Donnie's channel. I think next month. And I'm thinking of proposing to Donnie. I keep getting these Unitarians that want to debate, and I've been sort of brushing them off. How about what the full preterist guy? Unitarians? Huh. Oh, so how about those full preterist units? Yes, yeah, Stacy Turbville. He's a he's a interesting character. So I I debated him once when he held one view of God. Mm -hmm. A year later, he holds a different view, and he wanted to debate me. And I said, I said, look, Stacy. I said, let's wait a couple of years until you've changed your position, and uh, you know, again. And then I I want to debate. You know, what I mean, I want to debate your final position, right? Like, <laughs> let's talk about that, and then after that, you become a Trinitarian, right? <laughs> Uh, but anyways, yeah, he, he wants to debate again and, uh, he, he didn't know what happened in the first debate and I'm like, why am I going to do a second one? So I've been pushing him off and then, but actually just recently, Andrew Griffin asked if I would do a debate on Philippians two and the preexistence of Christ. Mm. And I'm thinking that's a possibility. I like Andrew and not that I don't like Stacy, but, uh, I'm thinking maybe I'll Anthony I'll, is the debate ever going to happen, happen with you and William Albrecht? <laughs> so here's the here's the funny thing now you asked the question i wasn't <laughs> going to bring this up because here's another thing i mentioned that it doesn't bother me to get flack from people but i've been reticent to bring people on and i've told people this repeatedly you know you mentioned that i'm going to get some of the you know fallout of the people that follow you i know that the people that i've been engaged with are not very you know, they, they don't have high marks when it comes to integrity mm. and they will say the most slanderous things about people. So I've been in my my mind. It's like I can take it all, send it all to me. In fact, I haven't even told people this. I'm not going to give the full details here, but there are certain individuals that were objects of attack from certain people. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to draw their fire. I will minimize the amount of time people have to attack these other people so that they can continue to do ministerial stuff and I'll just mm. be their lightning rod, right? And to some extent, it's been effective, though it hasn't completely dissipated their attacks on some of these other parties. But anyways, I, I often think, you know, I don't want to bring people on because I don't want to bring them into this. But, uh, okay, so with respect to the William thing, uh, Marlon could, could tell you, I mean, I just left it up to Marlon. I said, look, Marlon, I said, you continue to chase him if you want. Uh, I've done enough. I've tried to do this for a year. Uh, and it's just not happening. And these guys are going to keep lying. They're going to keep lying and pretending that I'm not, you know, look at what happened because the debate with Albrecht didn't happen. I debated an Eastern Orthodox guy. Let me tell you that I set up this debate with Seraphim the Eastern Orthodox guy, within a matter of days, we were able to agree on a time, a date, mm -hmm. a format. And we had almost no communication between then. And, and there was, you know, there was like no reason to uh, go back and forth or anything. We were just, we had a date set and we did it and it happened. Uh, it all happened within a matter of days, right? But with mm -hmm. William, it, it over the course of a year, the date kept changing and everything else. So I just kind of gave up on that. And then I, I kind of said, you know, after a year, I was like, I'm, I'm not even interested after this. Uh, I love what you've said, too, is if he ever changes his mind, you will drop, give you one day notice. You'll drop everything and make it happen. Well, I, I didn't say I was saying within that time period, I think I had said like after a year, I was like, then that's it. Right. But I was saying any time up to this point, mm -hmm. you tell me and I'll I'll be ready and I'll debate. Uh, you, I think you were spooking him because you're like, oh, if you want to talk about what the early church fathers taught, we can dance over there too, if you want. So in fact, I love that. Yeah. So let me comment. Okay. Uh, let me comment on Romans four. Cause this brings up something mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, mention with respect to my debate, uh, that I think will be helpful for people. But 
in, in Romans 4, it, it's significant. Every exegete makes this observation. It's significant that Paul, when talking about Abraham, drops the phrase of the law yep. and simply speaks of works, which is a more comprehensive term Absolutely. that includes works of the law, but any kind of work, anything that you do. I mean, that's the, the meaning of the term, right? Er, ergon. And, and BDAG seems to give the best first definition of um, human activity of any kind, deed, action. And just, just to chime in real quick, when you look at Abraham who precedes the works of the law, look what he did. And I'm saying whatever we look at with Abraham and the works that he did in the broadest sense of the understanding of ergon, that's going to help us understand the principal point in verse four. Now to the one who works, whatever singular person you want to uh, look at, whatever they do in general, if they're trying to do this to be made right with before God, well, they're earning it. It's no longer of grace. Yeah. And so a couple of things here. One is the fact that he uses the phrase works, which is more comprehensive than however you want to understand works of the law. Now, I don't think works of the law merely refers to ceremonial ordinances mm -hmm. or the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament or anything of that sort. In fact, it, it can't mean that because Paul makes, if you look back at Romans 3, this is why this is so significant. In 3.19, Paul says, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law mm -hmm. so that every mouth, note the yep. comprehensiveness, so that every mouth may be closed and Note the comprehensiveness again, the universality of this, and all the world may become mm. accountable before God. And contextually, that's Paul's whole point. In Romans 1, from 118 through to 318, he's showing that the whole world is sinful before God, is guilty of having violated his righteous character and standards, and so is under his just wrath. But Anthony, that's why the gospel's necessary. We're not under the law anymore, man. <laughs> well, so, uh, well, if one is in Christ, one is not under the law, meaning it has no power to condemn them. But those who are outside of Christ are still uh, uh, subject to the, that problem, right? Paul says, mm -hmm. so that the whole world, every mouth may be closed mm -hmm. and all the world may become accountable to God. So everyone is accountable to God, answerable to God with closed mouths, unless they are in Christ. And this is further proven by what Paul goes on to say. He says in uh, 27 through 31, that the gospel by which we're saved is for Jew and Gentile. This shows mm -hmm. the comprehensiveness of what Paul has in view here. He cannot possibly be restricting the the, the condemning law to those things right. that were specific to the Jews or exclusive to the Jews. It has to be something more comprehensive. And so when you get into Romans 4, now Paul's bringing forward his primary example. He's made the general point. Now he's giving his primary example. Now, before getting to that, actually, though, think back to, to Romans 3, because Paul, notice what he says in verses 21 through 26. He says, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed mm -hmm. by the law and the prophets. So apart from law, that is the requirements of God, but witnessed through the law, that is the written scriptures of the Old Testament, witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He here introduces the principle of faith, right? Faith is the way of being right with God. And on what basis? He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. So the, the grounds are given here. Namely, it's the propitiatory sacrificial uh, death of Christ. Uh, the means are given here uh, or is given here, which is faith. Mm -hmm. uh, what is not included here is excluded. It's, it's works, works of righteousness, works of the law. Uh, and all of this, therefore, is by grace. It excludes boasting. Right? This is what leads up to Romans 4. And, and it couldn't be clearer, not only because Paul uses the comprehensive term works, but also because of the nature of the antithesis. Right? Mm -hmm. Paul says in uh, verse 2, if Abraham, well, actually, note, note the connection in verse 1. It says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? So this shows that this connects back to chapter 3. 
-hmm. He's asking the question in light of what he says, what, what was found to be true in the case of Abraham? In verse two, it says, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Here is the positive affirmation of how Abraham was justified. Mm -hmm. He believed, right? Pistusan. This means believe, to, to hold to be true, right? <laughs> to affirm, to... Go ahead. Yeah, so... Lo I love the strong consistency that you're showing in Paul's argument, what he's trying to communicate. So what I've had to try to do with uh, specifically the Church of Christ crowd is to say, look, faith and works are not the same thing. They're mutually exclusive. Are they related? Absolutely. But they're different words with different meanings. And I try to show the obscurity if if because the, the Church of Christ are trying to say, well, faith is a work. Um, go read James 2, and then we deal with that context over there. I'm like, but look, if you're trying to make faith a work that we do, then it's totally um, nonsense. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, as is due, but to the one who does not work, but works um, in him, um, who justifies the ungodly, his work is counted as righteousness. It's nonsense at that point. And so, Yes, we believe that faith is a gracious gift granted from God that he works in us and we work out what he has worked in. But faith is not something that we do. We experience that gift, but that is a category of the heart. So tell me what you think about this. When I, I ask the question a lot of times in my debate, and when I, I debated a Greek Orthodox a um, year and a half ago on Marlon's channel, I asked him, what is the difference what are the differences between faith and works? He paused for about six seconds and he said, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is kind of getting at, you know, the, the core of the issue because faith is inward. Faith is of the heart. God tests the heart. God sees the heart. He looks where your trust is and he knows the moment when you have faith that you have faith. Right. And so works are things that now are outward Right. So ergon, we get our English word energy derived from this term. So anything that we can put on display, um, anything that we can accomplish by getting up and doing, that's a work by definition. And when I just had, you know, casual conversations with Church of Christ or people that to me is obviously works righteousness, we're not even getting into things that they think are justifiable by what you do. But when we just start defining the word works like you're talking about, they feel the direct implication of where we're going. So I've just I've tried to encourage people like when you're having these conversation is baptism a work? Absolutely. It's a ceremonial work that we participate in that the Holy Spirit is definitely involved with. Right. In our sanctification. But you got to have the proper categories. And to me, there's four good ones. Faith and works. Define those terms are not the same thing. Justification, sanctification, not the same thing. I even say and more words to scale the language barrier. Define baptism. Define the word obey. It means to be in agreement with. Obey and obedience doesn't always necessarily entail works. You can obey from the heart in faith, right? So I've just noticed um, the code language of, of the people that I interact with, of what they're getting at. And it takes time to really feel like, oh, they're, they're making an exception for uh, baptism uh, and not calling it a work and saying, oh, well, acts of obedience that you do, well, those are works of God. Hmm. Yeah, another way people try to smuggle their own virtue, works, contribution into the equation is making faith itself somehow a quality that forms the basis or grounds of God justifying, rather than... You, you didn't know faith really meant faithfulness? <laughs> well, and, and this is one of the key passages that just refutes it, especially in a soteriological context, because throughout this context, Paul uses it interchangeably with the verb believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's... Uh, well, okay, I was going to say something else, but I'll leave that aside. <laughs> um, the uh, one thing that's interesting is, you know, in, in Romans 11... Paul says, and you know the verse well, if it is by grace, then it is no longer by works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace, right. right? Now, the reason I think that's significant is because look at what Paul says in Romans 4, uh, 16. 16 yeah, yeah. He says, for this reason, for this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace, 
so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. Paul says that faith preserves the gracious character of salvation. Mm -hmm. If grace precludes works, if it is in the nature of the case, exclusive of works in the matter of salvation, then faith cannot be turned into a work. Right. And, and of course, as you've mentioned, faith is itself a gift of God, as Scripture uh, everywhere testifies. I, I've tried to tell people, faith is inward, works are outward. That's a good working example of how to understand faith is something that we're resting in as opposed to works or things that you get up and do. And sure, we can explain the narrative of Acts and things elsewhere to understand. Look, if you just understand the context, the gospel of grace is embedded in there. And Peter, whether it be Peter or a different apostle, they can call someone to justification and call someone to sanctification in the same breath. We're talking about a total disposition of life. But Scripture has given us these categories. And your debate with Seraphim, it, it felt like he would not define what sanctification was, justification, and glorification, because it seemed like, in their view, that's just all kind of meshed together. And you're like, Paul is trying to make an argument using different words with different meanings. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, okay, so if this is something that I wanted to go to, and it's it's ra basically right here in, in front of us in Romans 4, but hmm. Abraham mentions that, uh, or excuse me, Paul mentions that Abraham believed God, this is how he was justified in contrast to being justified on the basis of works. But when he speaks of this justification, it, it, he speaks of it in terms of it being credited or imputed to him. Now, in, in my debate, and I was astounded in, in this context, uh, and I mentioned to you before the show, one thing I didn't like about the debate is there, there should have been another rebuttal period, especially since my opponent didn't really rebut my opening in his opening, which left me, you know, I had no rebuttal period after that. The, the way it worked was, you know, there's uh, my opening, then his opening, and then two rebuttals, mine and then his. But what he did was he didn't rebut my opening. I had the burden of proving, so he had the responsibility of refuting. He didn't do that. He just gave his own positive presentation for his position, which would have been fine if it was a propositional statement we were debating rather than an interrogative. But anyways, he didn't do that so that when it, it came time, he gave this rebuttal to me eventually, and I never got to do a rebuttal. We did get to do cross-examination where I was able to show the, the mistake happened. Yeah, I was able to po <laughs> poke holes, I think, quite severely in his case. But, uh, you know, it, it left out some opportunity for rebuttal. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but here's the thing. It, uh, so I brought up that the righteousness on the basis of which God declares us righteous is a credited or imputed or mm -hmm. reckoned righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out, first I'll tell you what I said, and you heard it, but uh, then I'll get to what astounded me in, in terms of his response. But I pointed out that this whole idea is typified throughout the Old Testament. You have the example of Adam and Eve sinning against God, and then God stripping off their own attempts at covering their shame, stripped off their fig leaves and clothed them in the garments of a sacrificial animal, mm -hmm. right? Then I pointed out how uh, you have other examples of this sort of thing. For example, Jacob receives the blessings from Isaac. He receives the rights of the firstborn and, and all that goes with that by clothing himself in, in, in Esau's garments, mm -hmm. in the garments of the firstborn. I pointed out how the, the brothers of Joseph were only able to go back to their father uh, and assuage his wrath by presenting to him the blood-stained garments of Joseph. And then I showed that this sort of thing, I gave other examples, is not only typified, but it's explicitly taught in various mm -hmm. places, like Psalm 32. It's explicitly mm -hmm. taught in Zechariah 3, where you have Joshua the high priest, who's clothed in his own filthy garments, but those are stripped off of him, and he's clothed in clean garments. And then I Seraphim quoted, didn't like the fact that you're saying, yeah, this is kind of picturing what imputed righteousness looks like. Yeah, and, and so that was huge. So, so I I mentioned uh, then Re Revelation seven. I gave a bunch of other examples, but Revelation seven speaks of us being clothed in white robes, white because they were washed in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Now, what he wanted to do now, now I know that a lot of people probably didn't notice this. 
they, they probably stumbled at this point, but I'm thinking it's colossally bad, right? It's, it's huge. And it, I think exposes the, the antichrist nature of this gospel. They want to see themselves where they should be seeing Christ. Mm. And, and I'll yes. show you what I mean. So I pointed all this stuff and he went to revelation where it mentions that, uh, people are clothed and then this clothing represents the righteous acts of the saints. Now you and I don't disagree that we do righteous deeds, mm -hmm. right? And scripture can sometimes speak in uh, of our righteous deeds as clothing and so forth. But is that possibly what's going on in these cases that I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about justification and I'm talking about what's going on in these typological examples of our acceptance before the father. Is it the case that when Scripture speaks of Adam and Eve having their fig leaves stripped off of them and them being clothed by God, is that a picture of them mm. being justified before God on the basis of their doing? Is mm. that a picture of God graciously saving or man doing something mm. to save himself? Quite obviously, this right. is God acting to save, right? Is the picture of Joseph or Jacob being accepted by Isaac and receiving the blessings by virtue of being clothed in Esau's garments a picture of Jacob being blessed because of his own righteous acts or because he is presented before his father as though he were another, right? Yeah. As though he were clothed in somebody else's clothing, right? Yeah. Is were, were the, the brothers of Joseph able to, uh, you know, escape their father's wrath because of something they did or because they had the bloodstained garments of Joseph, which suggested to him the death of his son. Right. Is is the example in Zechariah three of Joshua being stripped of his fig li or excuse me, of his nate of his uh, filthy clothing and clothed in clean garments, an example of him being justified by his mm. acts? Absolutely. None of these examples have anything to do with the righteous acts of the saints. OK, so this isn't a denial that saints do righteousness. Right. But this is not unto justification. And, and, and Abraham is not an example of being justified by his righteous acts. In Romans 4, what we're talking about is Abraham being justified not by works, but it being credited to him. This isn't something that was his due. It was something that was granted as a favor to him, as grace, uh, the literal Greek term there. Mm -hmm. So this is what astounded me, right? Like you can read in Scripture all these clear passages about Christ and the gospel denier can see themselves where they should be seeing Jesus. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so much. Uh, I love, I, I was just like, man, I'm watching another Anthony Rogers episode uh, there, but you're right. Um, they're, they're seeing themselves <laughs> where they really should be seeing Christ. And I think when we go to Romans four, Abraham comes before the Mosaic law. And so I just think that's, that's so important um, for the question at hand. And so um, I think defining faith and works and really challenging those that can't see a distinction between those, it's going to really unravel Paul's argument that he's making. And uh, so going back, you're talking about all the type of uh, the, the typology that's going on in the Old Testament. I try to tell people this is what's at stake um, when your interpretation of James 2 is in such a way that you define a living faith is the moment it produces a particular work. Well, you now are adding your works to the already finished work of Christ. He said to Telestai, it is finished. The only way that I can understand that we are saved by works is Christ works, which was perfect. Never sinned, was never polluted uh, by, you know, um, a taint of sin. And so it's like, I want to be in him. I want to be represented by him. And that's the how the whole exchange happens is when you look upon Jesus by faith. You get that perfect robe, right, covering your account. And then all of your filthy rags, past, present, and future, get put back on Calvary. And so the Church of Christ world, they always say, well, it's your past sins that get washed away in baptism. And I ask, well, doesn't God see the entirety of your life? Or is it just in the past? And they're like, well, you've only committed certain sins. I'm like, yeah, but if you look more into what Paul says here about the blessed man quoting uh, Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So this is in the, the emphatic subjunctive, right? The strongest form of negation as possible. So in the debate, I was setting that garden path. Anthony, you'd have been proud of me. I was trying to be like, hey, um, I'm not trying to trap you yet. We should be agreeing at this point because in Hebrews 13, that quotes the Old Testament, 
uh, God will never leave us or forsake us. Ooh, may emphatic subjunctive uh, negation, meaning he's not going to leave us now or forever, regardless of, of if we believe that we can leave. But Christ, God will never leave us. And so as soon as I got him to admit to that, I said, OK, am I understanding Paul's point when I when I understand the same terminology being used? Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not, not now, not ever impute sin. And let's just say the wheels were turning a little bit um, hmm. when he answered that. Yeah, not impute sin. Now, let me share this, and then I think maybe it'd be good to take some questions. So, if Oh, we got any are... good questions out there? I've not been watching the chat. I, I haven't been paying attention yet because everybody knows I can't do that. <laughs> I can't uh, either. <laughs> I can't do two things at once. <laughs> but but uh, I just want to follow up since we've been talking about imputation. I want to show something interesting that I didn't bring up in the debate. Uh, but you know, well, well, let me say this just, just strategically, uh, I didn't do this either, but you know, I, I've, I've gotten used to groups that people, not just, well, groups and, and individuals that represent them. If, if somebody knows that something's in the Bible and they're pretending that their position is biblical, they're not going to say, I disagree with the Bible. Right. Right. They're going to say, I disagree with your interpretation. That's exactly. the way it works. Right. Even if it's clear, even if it's evident on the face of it, that that's what this is saying. Right. So, I mean, I learned this like a year after my conversion. I had I've told people this story. I said it on my channel more than once, but you'll have to suffer through it again if you've heard it before. Oh, that's okay. but for the benefit of those who haven't, I had I met this Mormon guy a year after I was converted and everything I told him from the Bible, he'd say, that's just your interpretation. I was like, well, you know, yeah, that's how I interpret it. But I, I don't think I'm doing something weird here that, you know, when you say, hey, hand me a napkin I and I hand you a napkin, I'm, I've I've interpreted your word. Sure. I think I've done so accurately, though. I don't think there was any you know magic steps I took or anything objectionable when I handed you the nap. Anyways, uh, but he would always say this. And it just irked me. And uh, one of the disputes we used to have all the time was whether or not Christ is God. Mm. And I would point him to passages and then I'd say, you know, Christ is God for this reason and that reason. And he'd say, that's just your interpretation. Well, one day he came up to me and out of the blue, he said, Christ is not God. And I said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And then he immediately shot back. That's just your interpretation. <laughs> and I said, I didn't give you my interpretation. I gave I you a it. quotation. Right. So now you know, he knew it was a quotation, but he was so ready to do his normal mantra that he didn't think it through. And he ended up, you know, walking into it. So one of the things I like to do, if possible, is quote something to somebody without telling them where it comes from and get their honest reaction. Mm. And so. One of the things I've thought of doing is, you know, just quoting a church father and saying, you know, what do you think about this or or what have you? Or let's play this game. Was this said by a church father or by a reformer? Right. Mm. And uh, you tell me, do you agree with this quote or not? And uh, I'm sure I could catch these guys a uh, hundred times on, on this because uh, some of these statements just sound like Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, whoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some just, you know, uh, vice versa. Right. But, but listen to this. These are some quotes on the passages that I read regarding uh, Adam and Eve, regarding uh, Jacob, regarding, uh, you know, all these passages. Listen, so this is from uh, Ambrose uh, with respect to Jacob being clothed in Esau's garment. So this is Ambrose, an early church father. He says the spiritual meaning is that we are not justified by works. He's talking about being clothed in Esau's garments. Right. Does he say it's the righteous acts of the saints? Listen to this. Seraphim, listen up. Does he say the righteous acts of the saints? He says the spiritual meaning is that we're not justified by works, but by faith, because the weakness of the flesh is a hindrance to works, but the brightness of faith puts the error that's in man's deeds in the shadow and obtains for him the forgiveness of his sins. Mm. Okay. In uh, an oration on faith and the resurrection, Ambrose said, in Adam I fell, in Adam I was cast out of paradise, in Adam I died, just as in Adam I am guilty of sin mm. and owe a debt to death, so in Christ I am justified. Okay, so just a similar idea there. Well, here's Cyril of Alexandria. He uh, is speaking here in reference to Christ's righteousness, gladness, and joy. And he says, we've been clothed with gladness and joy, and goes on to ask, what is this robe of gladness? And the answer he gives is Christ in whom we have been clothed. 
in his commentary on Zechariah 3, Cyril of Alexandria said, when God had mercy, he ordered them to be freed from sin and clad in the grace that justifies, not the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, elsewhere, he says, he who made the earth and mankind upon it, who adorned the heavens with the stars, has raised up Jesus as our righteousness, who redeems us freely, for we have been justified by faith. I, I could go on and on with quotes like mm -hmm. this. My point is just to say, this is solidly patristic, and it's mm -hmm. solidly Protestant in, in the sense that this is what the Protestants later came, came to say. This is what I was saying in the debate, and this is the opposite of what Seraphim was saying in right. response to it. So I, I found it really astounding, on the one hand, that he would take uh, the interpretation that he did of very clearly Christological statements and make them anthropocentric they're about man and what man does rather than what christ has done for us and also be very non-patristic ahistorical in his interpretation while pretending to represent the ancient faith so i found all that interesting all right so uh we've, we've said a bunch of stuff we've we've been at this for an hour and ten not that we couldn't be on for another hour <laughs> just by ourselves talking about different issues but i want to give people a chance to throw some stuff at us maybe some of your Church of Christ uh, people I hope have so. wandered they gotta be in. out there. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay, here's a question. I was looking for one, and then a super chat popped up. So Mason says, been thinking about the Apostolic Fathers. What's some good material to get into, like the epistles and stuff? Haven't read any yet. Either of you have favorites. Thank you both for your hard work. Now, uh, I don't know if Jeremiah has something he wants to say here, but what I'll say is, number one, read everything you can from the Apostolic Fathers. There's not a lot. Uh, it's usually all packaged in one volume, and you can get different translations. You can get the translation of Lightfoot. You can get the translation of Michael Holmes. Uh, you could get uh, various translations. And I actually recommend that people get several because... Sometimes, even with, when it comes to Bible translations, right, sometimes a different nuance is suggested by the way it's, it's translated, and it, it might provoke, you know, thought, you know, you might wonder which one is more accurate, or are both of these bringing out a shade of meaning that's there in the original? But uh, one reason I suggest it is because I've seen, for example, I'll give you an example of, uh, in, in the Epistle to Diognetus, uh, it, it makes mention of the great exchange, mm. right, of our sin and Christ's righteousness and how Christ took on himself our sins and died for them and gave us in turn his righteousness by which we are now justified in God's sight. There are some translations of this which lamentably render a certain word there as being made worthy when that's not what the Greek word means. It actually means uh, to be reckoned or regarded uh, as such, rather than to be made worthy. It, it's referring to one's legal status rather than their inward condition. Uh, but in any case, I, I'm just I'm pointing out that there are several different translations. Some are better than others, but uh, I think you should just get any book that, that gives you all of them because they all usually fit in one volume. And then after that, you can pick up uh, books like if you're talking about, I don't know if your question is specific to justification, uh, but uh, here's a book written by Brian Arnold, Justification in the Second Century. So this is a really good book. He shows that justification is found in numerous early Christian writings like Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, the Odes of Solomon, the Epistle to Diognetus, and so forth. So those are my thoughts. I don't know if Jeremiah wants to chime in with anything on that. Yeah, if someone were to ask me, so Jeremiah, where's a good place that I can go to learn a little bit more about the early church fathers? I would say I know a guy named Anthony Rogers uh, <laughs> that I would I would immediately point him to. And I would remind people this. For one, I'm still learning a lot with the the apostolic faith. I'm unashamedly, I tell people, I'm confident that what I will find are those people resting in Christ by faith. Whether they say alone or by implication, whether they understood consistently how to understand ceremonies, like I'm all for every bit of it. But at the end of the day, I care about the scripture. Now, that's not to exclude our historic faith. I'm just saying 
absolutely what you just said. Study our historic faith, how how Christ has been building his church for the past 2000 years, how the Holy Spirit has been guiding the church into truth. But test their argumentation. Don't just uh, say, well, this is their conclusion and they know better than me. Uh, that's not being faithful to what God's word commands us to do. That's not being a noble Berean. And so all, all I want to add is study the exegesis and the argumentation of the church fathers. But, and I've heard you say this before, Anthony, too, we would expect that second, uh, that, that second century uh, church to get many things wrong. Look at the people that followed Jesus, the disciples. Jesus constantly told them that it was necessary for him to suffer, to die, and to resurrect. They weren't getting it. You know what I mean? And them not understanding it wasn't a reflection of Jesus being a poor teacher. Look at the look at Galatians, the church of Galatia. They were already starting to depart from the grace of Christ and embrace a legalistic gospel, right? So I'm just saying the scripture gives us enough indicators that this next century after the, the last apostle, they were going to get many things wrong. But that's not to say that you can't still find the gospel of grace in many of these early writings. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good note. Uh, I probably don't say it enough. Uh, I, I love reading everything from church history, even stuff I disagree with. And a lot of the reason for bringing it up in this context is because the people I'm interacting with believe this is their strongest footing. They believe uh, there's a consistent uh, teaching that their church holds to now. Uh, that can be found in those writings. And I, I'm just sort of, you know, poking back at that saying, and now look at this, look at this, look at that. I was uh, so surprised when you agreed initially to debate William Albrecht about the church fathers. Did they teach justification by faith? Because when you were, when you, when I saw that, I just thought, oh, I cannot wait. And I was so let down. We were going to have a watch party here at 12 five yeah, and then it yeah. didn't happen. We were like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I was, I was disappointed as well. <laughs> Um, all right. So another question here. This is from Adam Carmichael senior, Adam, Adam, right over there, your right hand. Oh man. yeah. Adam's he the asked, man, by the way. <laughs> can you, Oh, for those that don't, Oh, well, anyways, can you speak on original sin? The church of Christ rejects this doctrine. Interestingly, so does the Eastern church, at least the, mm, they reject the Western version mm. of this but uh okay so you go ahead since it's specific to the church of christ <clears throat> well like he's getting at they just they deny that we're born in sin you know like the way that david speaks of it and um how we are all in adam and we and we've died um but they believe that our environment corrupts us i really think and i've been told i've been uncharitable saying this i don't think so but they're modern day pelagians um, they believe yep. that we're born innocent and perfect, and then we we sin over time because of our fallen environment. So <clears throat> that's why Church of Christ at large, they actually deny baptismal regeneration, the way that they're interpreting Acts 2.38 and various other baptismal passages. Um, they hold, and they wouldn't say this, but I've coined this, they believe more in a baptismal justification. Why? Because they don't really think they need a new nature. Right. They they are just born um, like Adam was created, um, innocent and upright, essentially. Um, so I just wanted to tell the audience that's kind of the background of original sin. But I would love for you to really speak to that, too. Why that that is just totally absurd um, when we look at Scripture. Yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting, just as an, an aside on this, in the Targum on Ruth, just one example comes to mind, because a lot of people think that this. Some people will criticize the doctrine of original sin as a New Testament innovation. Mm. So you'll get Jews who will say this isn't found you know, in the Old Testament. Then you'll get people who say it's not found in the New Testament. Sometimes right. you'll get people who say Paul taught it, but they don't like Paul. And so they excise him <laughs> from the list of you know, canonical writers and, and so forth. Uh, so you get a variety of denials mm -hmm. on this. But what's interesting is if you look at something like the Targum on Ruth, it mentions Jesse, the father of King David, because you've got this genealogy there from Ruth and Boaz. That, that it, the, the idea is it's it's giving you the, the the genealogy that will lead up to David. That's why it's there, and it mentions the death of Jesse. And one of the things it wants to say about Jesse is that he was a righteous person. Mm. But by righteous, it doesn't mean not in Adam, not guilty. It just means he was an upright individual. 
And, but it, it creates something of an issue. And so they want to explain how is it that Jesse, who was righteous, died. And so what it says, very interesting. It says he died because Adam sinned, mm. right? The, the, the sentence that was passed upon the human race because of Adam's sin was brought to pass on Jesse. So it's specifically laying uh, it, this at the feet of Adam. This is why uh, Jesse dies. He's culpable for Adam's sin. Uh, and there's other statements like that in rabbinic literature. But for those that accept the authority of Scripture, what's clearer than Paul's words in Romans 5? Right. right? Oh, there he sets forth the federal headship of Adam, all men who are descendants of his by means of ordinary generation, that is, all who come into the world through the process of ordinary biological procreation, are born into it as guilty and corrupt. We're, we're guilty, meaning that we're liable to God's wrath and curse, and corrupt, meaning that we are inclined towards evil. We, we are sinful by nature, and out of that sinfulness proceed all actual transgressions. But Paul couldn't be clearer. He says, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin, except that Mary, is, huh? Excuse me. I say except oh, Mary, oh yeah, except Mary. But it, it, he's saying that that death spread to all men because of the sin of Adam. All sinned in Adam, uh, and, and he goes on. He, he says that death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of the one who is to come. So, uh, what, one question that I you like I like to ask people. This was a classic question that was mm. being asked of the Pelagians in their day is why do babies die? Right. right. Uh, and, and Paul says, well, even though they haven't necessarily personally engaged in an act of transgression uh, in the sense of being fully conscious uh, as sure. they will be when they grow up and so forth, uh, he says they die. Why do they die? You know, that's the, the million dollar question. If you believe Paul in Romans 5, you know why. But mm -hmm. if you're a church of Christ, you're going to have to chuck and jive there. So I want you to engage with an objection I hear too. Jeremiah, have you not read Ezekiel 18? The soul that sins will die. And in that, I want you to speak a little bit to that context because we've read that before. And my immediate answer is what that's showing us is that we also will be culpable for our own sin as well, right? Original sin is a different issue. It's just speaking to how we were born children of wrath. I think that's a Bible verse somewhere in Ephesians 2, right? And I'm like you. I like to just mention that we're children of wrath, not reference it to see if they realize that I'm actually quoting a Bible verse. Yeah, I got to say, you can't do the Hebrews thing and quote the actual chapter. The, the author of oh, Hebrews, yeah. he says, somewhere it is written, right? And he's quoting Psalm 8. <laughs> You said somewhere yes. it's written, Ephesians 2. <laughs> You're right. No, that's true. <laughs> but yeah, Ezekiel 18, they think this is a defeater for the Protestant doctrine or, or the Church of Christ. They disparage the name denominations. That's just denominational teaching. We're the we're the Church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. I'm like, do you greet one another with the holy kiss? I'm just, <clears throat> never mind. Um, so yeah, they, they'll mention uh, Ezekiel 18 as a defeater to original sin. Yeah. So, well, one quick answer is we don't think in the first place that in terms of imputed guilt, that the sin of everyone's ascendant is imputed to them. We proclaim the federal headship of Adam. It was Adam who was created as the federal head of the human. Look at Hosea 6, where it mentions that uh, Adam broke the covenant. It's specifically talking about Adam there, and I challenge anybody who wants to make it refer to something else. It's talking about Adam breaking a covenant. There was a covenant that God established with Adam, which he broke. And it's clear from Paul in Romans 5 that he was the representative of the human race in that covenant, such that when he transgressed, it had devastating consequences for all of his descendants. In fact, for the entire cosmos. In Romans 8, Paul mm -hmm. speaks of the, the whole cosmos being subject to bondage and decay, mm -hmm. right? Why? You know, because it, the cosmos sinned? No, because Adam, mm -hmm. who is the head, uh, you know, uh, sinned. So in, Does that mean you're one, a young earth creationist? Oh, I am, but uh, I don't usually talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so number one, we don't necessarily teach that everyone's ascendant acts and though their descendants are culpable. So that's, that would be the quick answer. Right. Yeah. And 
but also well, one of the problems they have to deal with too, I and mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that could be said about Ezekiel 18, but one other thing to say is what, why is the Ezekiel even saying this? Because the people are objecting that they're suffering when it was mm. their parents who did something wrong. And, and, and this is an inescapable fact of life. Think about this. It's an inescapable fact. If your parents do something, you know, if you have a father, let's say, who's an alcoholic and he goes out and gets in a car wreck, you know, he, uh, he then goes to jail. He loses his job. He, you know, all these consequences fall out from that. Are you not going to suffer the consequences of that, even though you didn't do anything? It's an inescapable fact of life. We, we can complain about it, but we can't escape it. Hmm. Right. Well, the Israelites are looking at their condition and they're saying, look, here we are in this situation. And it was our fathers who did this. Okay. So Ezekiel 18 is, is, is addressing a problem against this undeniable background. Right. So deal with that. Right. Deal with the fact that the is the Israelites are complaining because this was their situation. And uh, I agree with you, you know, as it goes on, it's talking about people being, you know, if, if a person repents of sin, God's not going to hold him accountable for, you know, the sins of his parents uh, or his own sins. And if a person doesn't repent, he's going to hold him accountable for his sins. Uh, it, it is teaching personal responsibility. We don't deny that. I mean, there's there's a thousand things I think that can be said about oh, that. Yeah. Maybe no. Huh? Okay. I, no, I was just saying that. No, that's really good. I wanted to chime in and say, uh, somebody by the name of Chloe, thank you for the super chat. And I, I want to tell you, I was. She included me. Out. She included me that I that I get some coffee in this. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, definitely. And I uh, maybe sometime. I think when I looked, I think. Uh, I think you're like 10 hours from me, mm. but how far is, well, maybe I'll talk to you behind the scenes about some of this, but one day it'd be great to, uh, to meet up in person. How far are you from Indiana? So I, I live in South Carolina. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, we, we were in Arkansas, uh, some time ago for medical testing for our youngest. Uh, but I didn't know you were there at the time. I didn't even know about you. This was a few years ago. Our, our church, we have a guest house. So anytime you and your family come, y'all have a place to stay. You have a manse. You guys call it a manse? <laughs> we, we like to refer to it as kind of the parsonage, but it's it's a nice parsonage. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Chloe, by the way. All right. There was another, um, I think there was another one that I missed. Um, I hate to miss any. And then I feel, I feel bad. While you're um, looking for that, I just I want to encourage people that the doctrine of original sin is huge. Um, this this you'll this may be news to you with Church of Christ. So they do not believe Christians have the indwelling Holy Spirit, not ontologically or actually. They think that's a, really? all an Acts paradigm. But it makes sense. They deny original sin. You do not need a transformed nature by the Spirit. And so, you know, in the whole debate of let me see, what do you mean by an axe paradigm? Well, their whole deal is you got in order to be a Christian, you got to do what the Christians did in Acts. But they're going to quickly dismiss the gifts of the Spirit. They're going to quickly dismiss any real indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They, at large, believe that the Holy Spirit is in you only when you read the inspired Scripture. So like you had thinking scripture, that's the Holy Spirit in you. Now, not every church of Christ believe that that's just at large what's talking about. And what I was going to say real quick is in the ongoing discussion with continuationism and cessationism, um, I've been accused of being a radical cessationist, Jeremiah. And I'm like, how can I paint a spectrum from somebody? Because I believe still many the spirits at work and dwelling believers transforms our nature, seals us to the day of redemption. Um, and, you know, not to totally get into the sign gifts and how I understand that. I thought it'd be good to actually point some people to a group that is a radical cessationist, and it's the Church of Christ. They believe the Holy Spirit does not in any way transform your nature. You have the ability to make the right decisions and do the, the proper works of obedience to be made right with God. And I'm like, that's your radical cessationists that do not believe that they even have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Sorry to be distracted. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. So uh, the free thinker, this is Tyler is Vela. It? Tyler Vela. I was on um, Eli Yala's channel last week or so, 
and we talked a little bit about Tyler. Um, so now you're telling on yourself, you're telling Tyler to go listen to that and see what you said about it. Yes. Yes, please do. <laughs> so uh, I just thought it was funny. He says uh, that outs Anthony is a Presbyterian. So if it yeah. does, it does. I didn't realize that was specific to Presbyterians that we use that term. Uh, so mm. a manse, for those that don't know, is, is just common jargon for a, uh, a house that's usually connected <laughs> to a church, either like on the same property or maybe even attached to the building. But it's the idea is that a pastor would live there and that was part of how the church supported him was they would support the house Anthony, and the church. You'll have yeah. to forgive me. I'm a reformed Baptist. So I, I didn't catch that. Went, <laughs> well, so um, I, yeah, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that the term Mance was specific to Presbyterians. Um, That's awesome. Uh, I but, learned that. Uh, yeah. I mean, so did I <laughs> <laughs> just shows you <laughs> how we can uh, be in our own little world with uh, certain mm -hmm. things. All right. So, um, all right, let's see here. Um, just seeing if, uh, take a look. Yeah. So John a, I don't know what he's referring to. How's that not blasphemy? How else do we receive Christ without being born? Oh, okay. So he must be responding to, or reacting to something you said about the church of Christ view. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, acts paradigm. I don't know. It's so odd that they would think that you don't need a new nature, uh, right. that they would deny the inward presence. That's why, that's why they deny baptismal regeneration, and they'll just say, we're not of the denomination of the Roman Catholics. And I'm just like... And so as I ask more questions and dig deeper... The way that they understand baptism, that's the moment that they're justified. And so yeah. really it's this baptismal justification apart from a transformed nature. And I'm like, ah, this makes sense why you deny the, the Holy Spirit um, changing your name. This is why um, you don't think fundamentally you need a new heart because you think yeah. you, you got the tools at your disposal already. You know, this is interesting because I, I think I suspect one reason they might want to say we're not part of that group, right, is because... Mm -hmm. They're thinking this group is way out there and we don't want to be associated with them. But what's interesting is they actually end up, I think, shooting themselves in the foot because this ends up making a point that I've made that the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic Church at the time of Trent, had a much higher view of grace than a lot of these pseudo-Christian cults mm. and even then many contemporary Roman Catholics. Because if you read Trent, they had a very high view of grace. It's not the same high view that you find in Protestantism generally, but uh, it was a higher view of grace than you find among many Catholics today and even uh, than apparently this group. The, the Roman Catholic Council of Trent was not Pelagian. It, mm. you, know, you can read Trent. They insist on grace, the necessity of grace. And we'll even say some things that many Roman Catholics would, would be shocked at. They'd think, oh, that just I thought that was a Protestant idea. But uh, man is only mostly dead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, yeah, they, they, they definitely aren't fully Augustinian or anything like that. Uh, or even as robust as something you might read at the Council of Orange. But uh, oh, yeah. So this so somebody says here, Morg, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, Morgay or Morg. Uh, says, did you see William Albrecht's video response to you on Mariology? Now, I think that guy should be ashamed to ever mention my name, right? Personally, that man should be ashamed of himself. I chased him for over a year and his master should be ashamed as well. The guy who <laughs> told him he had to debate me because he didn't want to. They both should be ashamed. Uh, why are they responding to me when they didn't want to debate these topics? You know, now, now Sam jumped ship, right? Didn't he somewhat start out Protestant or now I know he's a Syrian church, the East or something. I don't really know his background, but I don't I feel know like that he knows content. Yeah. I always say that, uh, you know, there's only one true church and Sam doesn't belong to either one of them. Uh, meaning that he keeps talking about these apostolic churches, right? The Eastern church, the Roman Catholic church, the Oriental Orthodox, all these other groups, the Eastern church claims it's the one true church. And if you don't belong to her, then you are lost. The Roman hmm. Catholic church claims to be the one true church. The Assyrian church claims that it's the true church. Uh, church of Christ uh, claim that they're the one true church. Because right. And you, Romans not only do you have to be baptized, says, right? Is this no, correct? You got to be baptized in the church. Of Christ. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but so I think it's funny, you know, these churches that he keeps defending, he's not part of, and at least the Eastern church would say he's lost. Rome is confused. It depends if you're asking the, the Tridentine Roman church or post, you know, second Vatican to Roman Catholicism, you know, you might be a separated brethren and that could mean any one of a dozen different things. But anyways, uh, yeah. So I, I have seen that they did a response to me on Mary. Now I'm, I'm not going to watch it. I don't even care to watch it. I don't get my information from these guys. I don't think that they have the ability to uh, deal with. I mean, first of all, for those that don't know, I've done like 10 hours on this topic. Mm. Uh, you can be sure he's chopped up everything I've said. He's probably distorted it, misrepresented it. Uh, these guys have had no shame about lying on, on things I've said in the past. So I'm just not even interested in looking at that. But I did see, I did see this. I saw that Shamoon has said uh, he wants to debate me and somebody else. So him and William Albrecht are going are, are willing to debate me on Mary, right? So neither one of them wanted to debate me by themselves, right? William didn't you, want to debate me on justification you by just himself. Be by yourself, two v yeah. one. Well, so well, here's what I was thinking. Okay. Uh they call themselves brothers in arms. And the way this looks to me is like neither one of them wants to do this by themselves. So they should be called men holding hands. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, uh, that's don't, don't blame Jeremiah for this people. This is my, this is my wit. This is my way of talking. I'm, I'm just poking fun here. Anthony. Uh, they, so back when I debated, um, a Roman Catholic on was Mary sinless or not. So, um, William made a video saying that his blood was boiling when somebody, you know, misrepresents the mother of their Lord and these things. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> they invited me to come on their channel and talk and i had about 10 people immediately say don't do it Jeremiah. don't do it because i didn't really know them i knew some of the old content that sam had had but i'm so glad i didn't uh, because i could detect that it would not be charitable and i would have been roasted to no end because i really do want to have a charitable conversation with people people can go look at my content and you'll see it uh, the way that i debated with gavin james in a debate tried to show him a lot of love and grace, asking him questions. But when he was just sitting there and seven seconds ticked by, I'm just like, Hey, you think on it, we'll come back to it later, but let's, you know, kind of move on. I don't want to kick somebody when they're down, but I just noticed that those two, they're, they're not necessarily trying to accomplish the same goal there. Um, yeah. And you know, so I've kind of gone back and forth. I'm thinking how much more time do I want to spend directed at them? But you know, people keep asking questions and, uh, so it's, it keeps coming up and I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I go back and forth. I, there are plenty of people that I think have made the right choice not to engage that. Uh, Gavin Ortland, for example, mm. very respected by Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox people is ironic approach and so forth. And he's actually refused to interact with the material those guys are putting out. Now I, I, started... I, I talked to Gavin recently and just said, hey, I appreciate um, how you're able to have a meaningful interaction with William. And he says, by no means. He's like, <laughs> that person is not respectful. He, and he was just saying what you're saying. I refuse to like go any further. Like, I really enjoyed Gavin's debate uh, with Trent Horn. You know what? That was respectful dialogue. It seemed like a very historical approach from both sides. But at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? That was a refreshing conversation where two men can be respectful towards one another. Yeah. And, you know, I think in my debate with Seraphim, I told him at the end, I said, I enjoyed interacting with you. You're very different than the other people I've been interacting with. Mm. If this was the sort of thing that uh, I was doing to begin with, this is how I started engaging these groups with, with somebody like Seraphim. This all would have been a different thing. And as I mentioned, I, I thought that what I would do is sort of draw the fire of these guys you know, that way other people can have respectable dialogue. Mm. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to be bothered by this sort of thing. I so, know for a fact that you don't get bothered easy because you debated, oh goodness, I don't remember what channel it was on, but I'm pretty sure it was a Muslim and that was a fireworks show. And I just remember oh, thinking, I don't, you're thinking of Osama Abdullah. I think so. Yes. Yeah, so that was Osama, brutal. Osama <laughs> and I go back a long time. I debated him, I don't know, over a decade ago in Dearborn in person. And 
used to go back and forth with him when I was writing for Answering Islam. Mm -hmm. He had his own website, Answering Christianity. And so we would write rebuttals against each other and this sort of thing. So we've got a long history. And I, I know Osama, he, he's guttural in, in his speech and so forth. But at the same time, it's sort of like a, uh, you know, he's easy to, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the way I think of it is just, you know, underneath all that, there's a sinner. <laughs> don't get me wrong. But uh, this this guy, what he's doing is more compensating than anything else. He has to ramp up the rhetoric because mm. substance is lacking. And I just look past some of that stuff for that reason. Sure. Um, but anyways, yeah, so uh, it is that is what it is. But. Um, oh, so Slam asked, did you and David get arrested in Dearborn? So this was a different occasion. I don't know. David wasn't there. In fact, ironically, Sam was there with me on this occasion. Mm. Uh, Sam also debated Osama. Oh, but the debate you're talking about with Osama was probably a more recent one than right. I did. Yeah, yeah. Within the past year or so. Yeah. Uh, but at this debate, I was there with Sam, Eddie Dalcor, and uh, Lewis Lionheart. We were all there for that debate. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see. Am I missing any questions here? Uh, J Box says, "Legend has it, Osama is still calling everything a conjecture till this very day." <laughs> yeah, he's a funny. Uh, Osama's a funny man. Um, actually, yeah, his his uh, constant refrain was um, his constant refrain was that's just spaghetti. Everything he didn't get back in the day, ten years ago, he kept saying that's just spaghetti, right? <laughs> so uh, at one point in his debate with Eddie or Doctor Edward Dalcor. He kept saying, that's spaghetti. And then Dr. Dalcor at one point says, talk about spaghetti. That's just burnt sausage, right? It's classic debate line. Uh, anyways. That's good. Do you, have you debated atheist? I'm sure you have at some point. I was just trying to recall if, if you engage much with online atheist philosophers. Uh, so I haven't done any online stuff with atheists. The, the way it worked for me it was I I was converted in a hostile context, a context that was hostile to the gospel. And for that reason, got interested in apologetics because I wanted to evangelize people. And I realized I have to be able to defend what I'm proclaiming to them as good news. And I sort of basically decided that I would learn stuff about the groups that I was encountering. Hmm. So I would go to the university campus. And in those days, you know, of course on the university campus, I was getting bombarded with atheistic type issues. So, uh, Darwinian evolution, uh, and other things that were part and parcel of atheism, uh, the more philosophically inclined, you know, we're arguing, uh, different, uh, philosophies, but, but uh, online, I haven't really done that. Uh, but, oh, but my, my basic point is just this. I, I was basically dealing with things as they came. You don't get to choose. Is this person going to be mm. an atheist? Is he going to be a Buddhist? Is he going to be church Christ? It was whoever came to me. That's who I was going to uh, focus on. And if I kept running into them, I'm going to read their literature. Mm. And so uh, eventually I started getting into a lot of interactions with Muslims. So that kind of mm. directed yeah. things for me. And that's why I eventually started writing for Answering Islam and then doing debates with Muslims and stuff like that. Uh, the, the reason it's the same thing with this whole Catholic Eastern Orthodox mm -hmm. thing. I had no interest in these guys. These guys created this problem, right? Yeah. If they don't like me and they're they're upset they came knocking at your door. Say, yeah, they, they, they should have never addressed me. Right. Because <clears throat> that's what brought me out. I had no interest in their groups. I was happy refuting Muslims. I was happy refuting Unitarians. Right. If these people didn't come along and say, hey, look, we hate your gospel. We don't believe Christ is sufficient. We want to put Mary and the saints in his place. We want to detract from the glory of God. We want to do all if if they didn't do that, they wouldn't have heard from me. Now I'm here. Yeah. Well, um, very similar with my apologetics ministry. It really started out um, when we flew Marlin in, debated Church of Christ live and in person at the university here in my town. And so a lot of my content has been helping equip people to show how, you know, water Baptism is a wonderful thing to glorify um, and show how um, God is working in your life, right? So anyway, that was a big part. 
And then something else that spawned in my local context is full preterism. There are two local churches, one being an SBC church preaching full preterism from the pulpit unashamedly so. Blows my mind. So I've had a lot of those men reach out to me, didn't really understand what was going on. I was very comfortable in my John MacArthur premillennial dispensational eschatology, realizing, uh-oh, I got to start taking these things serious. Uh, and so for the past year, I've been studying to debunk and um, expose full preterism, hyper preterism, and realizing that, uh, man, this is just an overhaul, you know, in light of all the recent stuff going on with Gary DeMar, which is, you know, just shocking. Um, but that's another big portion of on my channel is speaking to what full preterism teaches and where it's wrong, how it fails historically, how it fails logically, and then it fails ex ex exegetically ultimately. And so, um, I, I will say I'm not pre-millennial anymore. Um, but I think that is orthodox along with all mill and post mill. And I will be speaking at a conference in Indiana in September. I've been invited by eschatology matters. I'll be preaching on, um, the resurrection of the dead and how that's a part of our blessed hope. Yeah. You know, interestingly, uh, Max King was a hyper preterist and wasn't he a church of Christ? He was. And I tried to <laughs> tell some of these men in my local town that, that claim to be reformed. I'm, I'm like, look, you've denied the historic faith. You're not reformed anymore. You're Calvinistic. And that there's a distinction there, but I'm like, you're listening to church or Christ teaching. This spawned out of that stuff only within 200 years ago. This is new on the span of church history. So you're, you're absolutely right. And it just baffles me to no end. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking earlier, you mentioned Bonson. I went to a Christian classical school, Christ College, when it was in Lynchburg, Virginia, before it moved down to Georgia. I don't like saying going down to Georgia. It always reminds me of the sun. <laughs> Devil went down to Georgia. <laughs> That's what no. I was thinking. But uh, I went to it. Was, it so Bonson was one of the people that helped start that school. He wasn't there when I got there. He 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 died before long before I went. But uh, at the time, Ken Gentry was mm. teaching modular courses. He taught a modular course when I was there on eschatology. And then eventually when I went to seminary in Greenville, uh, when I moved to Greenville, Ken Gentry lived 10 minutes away from me. And so I would sometimes go over to his church. And of course he's a preterist, not a hyper preterist. Right. But I, I mention this because both DeMar, Gary DeMar and Ken Gentry studied under Bonson mm. back at RTS back in the day and preterism, not hyper preterism. Right. But just the idea, nobody should object to the bare term almost. I mean, everybody could be called a preterist to some extent. Mm -hmm. Right. In the sense that all preterism means is gone by or past. And so everybody's a preterist, at least with respect to certain prophecies. We're all preterists when it comes to Isaiah 714. If we're Christians, right, we believe <laughs> in the, the same principle. We're futurists to a degree in terms of our blessed hope. Yeah. So everybody believes that Christ has been born of a virgin. Right. We're all preterists. We believe that prophecy has happened. If you're an Orthodox Christian, you believe that there are certain things that are still future, like Christ's visible, audible, palpable second coming, uh, his resurrection of the dead from their tombs, uh, the final judgment, the consummation of the new heavens and the new earth. Everybody's a futurist. Anthony, if, all, all that was at 70 AD, man. <laughs> well, so <laughs> point being that the Orthodox preterism that was being taught by Bonson was taught to people like Damar and Gentry. Mm. But there's been a lot of issues going on lately with Damar, and I haven't paid too much attention to all of it. But from what I understand, there's questions about where he's at with respect to these Make things them. and whether or not he's embraced hyper preterism. Uh, I'm not going to comment on whether he has or hasn't because I, I, I haven't kept up on it, but I will say that I thoroughly, adamantly reject uh, hyperpreterism. Yeah, and I've done two uh, shows recently um, with Dr. Sam Frost, who, came, who was a lead speaker of full preterism for a decade and came out of it. I mean, this dude knows the ins and outs. And the concerning thing with DeMar 
is he is refusing to affirm, you know, those essentials of our blessed hope about Christ's future bodily coming, um, that we are going to receive resurrected bodies fit for eternity, and that Christ is going to restore all things. His deal, and you can kind of go look in this and your audience, is he's just saying, okay, you tell me your proof text to support those major points. And what he's been doing every time is the, the verses that are being brought to him, he shows how it don't mean that. And so it's just really concerning because he's hashtag that post mill life. You know what I mean? And um, I've loved his last day's madness and I've encouraged people to read these things. And I think there's a beauty to partial preterism, understanding historic orthodox preterism, understanding how God was working in the early church. But yeah, it's, it's a whole deal. And mm. the, uh, the reason why I brought that up is going back to what you said. I wasn't searching out after um, having I was comfortable in my eschatology. Right. I've a lot of times told people eschatology is the third tier issue that we can talk about over coffee and disagree and shake hands. I didn't realize somebody could have just such a skewed eschatology that it corrupts the gospel of grace. I believe it, it changes the nature of who Jesus is to say that he not only returned in 70 AD, but it was in spirit form. Well, that's Gnosticism, right? You're talking about a different Jesus at that point, and it's no longer a, a gospel that triumphs over sin. I don't know if this is news to you, but they believe that this world, of sin continues on into infinity and so that has logical problems that i've gotten into but all this showed up in my hometown and i have to guard the flock from this so i'm like you i wow. didn't go searching after a lot of these things so we've shifted a little bit but that's <laughs> not a problem because we've talked a lot about justification we've answered some questions mm -hmm. i don't see additional ones on justification so i don't have a problem everybody agrees with us but one one issue that uh you just reminded me of so when i first encountered uh, somebody who held to hyper preterism. It was back in the nineties hmm. and I had done a lot of stuff with Jehovah's witnesses. Right. So I remember uh, one of the things that was surprising to me was when I learned that Jehovah's witnesses didn't believe that Christ is bodily risen from the dead. And part of that had to do with their idea. They, they made a number of false predictions about the return of Christ and the, the, the next time around, right, after several false predictions, instead of saying, oh, wrong date, what they did was they redefined the nature of his second coming. And so they mm -hmm. defined it as something invisible and all that. And this tied in with the whole idea that he's not presently embodied. He doesn't presently have a resurrected body. And so the reason I bring this up is I was talking to this person who was a hyperpreterist. I didn't even know what hyperpreterism was. And and I was talking to this person and uh, they said that everything happened in AD 70. And I said, well, then how do you define the nature of Christ and his, you know, I know there's a number of ways you could try to deal with this, but the way this person dealt with it was to say that Jesus was not physically raised from the dead. It was a spiritual resurrection. And so that's how they could explain all the passages that talk about his coming, including those that we would normally interpret as a reference to his bodily coming, right? So they would say that it's just, it's all spiritual. And uh, so uh, my understanding, at least of some versions of preterism, hyperpreterism, maybe not all, I don't know, but uh, is that some of them deny that Christ right now is the incarnate son most the right do. Of the Father. They believe that he was reabsolved as the eternal Logos into the Godhead. Wow. And so how do they interpret that he is still the God man interceding on our behalf as the one mediator? We'll say, well, he still has thoughts of when he was in the incarnation <laughs> and somehow that counts. And I'm yeah. over here like different Jesus. Paul warned us about people wow. like y'all. So one of the things I do with these groups, besides obviously hammering those texts that talk about Christ's post-resurrection appearances, which are all quite clearly intended to drive home the point that he's a real resurrected, you know, incarnate person. Yeah, but Anthony, but, those are before 70 AD. But, but, uh, <laughs> well, so part of the problem, though, even with that, is at what point then, biblically, do you say Christ ceased having that body? Because... Mm. I can I can keep going with this, but it gets worse. But but here here's as an example of what I'm talking about. In Colossians two, Paul says, "In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily." It's present tense. Mm. In Christ dwells all the fullness of deity in bodily form. 
So he's saying when he wrote that, now they'll say this is prior to AD 70, but it's very clearly far after Christ's ascension that Paul's writing to the saints in Colossae, right? Mm -hmm. So at, at that point, Paul's thinking of Christ as having ascended into heaven and still being embodied. But now here, here's why, I mean, it gets even worse. In Acts 17, when mm. Paul's preaching to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill, Paul says that God has fixed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed, and he's given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So here Paul speaks of the judgment that's going to be wrought as being exercised by a man who was raised from the dead. And so, that, well, they might say that's 80-70, but isn't that a problem, right? Because he's now a that's, man. With that's DeMar's the stance. Event. That day, he thinks, well, and how you're interpreting the Greek, um, that day is is soon, right? It's it's around the corner, rather than like Gentry and Philip Kaiser say, it's a certainty to happen. Yeah, but, but it's still missing the point that mm, it's yeah, talking about yeah, yeah. Jesus as a man, man. exercising so you can't get around this problem of denying the real bodily resurrected nature of Christ. Right. He was embodied long after uh, his resurrection. He was embodied mm -hmm. after his ascension. He was embodied when Paul wrote to the saints at Colossae. He was embodied even in AD 70, if you think Acts 17.31 is talking about AD, AD 70. I don't. I'm just saying if you do, right. you have to affirm that. And now you have to deal with the very physical nature of this person in connection with that event. What do you think about this? Uh, I've, I've been teaching at 12.5 through 1 John uh, 4, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. I believe that's in the perfect tense, right? So this is speaking to a reality that Jesus, this past event has future ramifications that Jesus is the God man. And guess what? He's still the God man. And this theologically, um, he's continually interceding on our behalf. He can only do that if he's true, a true representative, a true representative of who we are. So I love, I love what you're saying too. It's like, no matter where you want to tackle this, um, we can rest knowing that not only did Jesus raise bodily, he wasn't the exception. He was the rule. First Corinthians 15 says, hey, that's how your resurrected body, by the way, is going to be. That's not code for Old Testament Israel or something like that. But Jesus is reigning um, at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Amen. Well, uh, maybe it's sorry, a good time. I, I roped you um, off of what we initially started. I had I had to get. Anthony Rogers' thoughts on hyperpreterism when I had the chance. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. I usually try to avoid aspects of the eschatological question only because I, in my experience, I've met people that they want to make certain things with respect to eschatology, the mm. be all and end all of Christianity. Right. right. And they want to define the parameters of the of the faith and who's in it and who's outside of it in terms of things that I don't think really have. I do think the resurrection of Christ, mm -hmm. the return of Christ, the final judgment, the resurrection of the body, all those are critically mm -hmm. necessary. They're right. essential, fundamental to the Christian faith. But there are other things related to eschatology that I don't think are necessarily of that sort right. and that good men can differ on as we try and work towards a, a, you know, a more mature understanding. And that's and agreed that's upon what understanding. full preterism does. They pry on those things that we have charitable dif dis disagreements with, and then they interpret everything in light of 70 AD. So I mean, it's a complete overhaul, a different hermeneutic, and I didn't realize how dangerous it was. Yeah. So so my, my point is just I, there's important stuff that I want to talk to mm -hmm. that I know some people will shut me out if they know I hold this particular view about the rapture, you know, mid, pre, you know, post, whatever trib or we know your post mill. <laughs> nobody <laughs> knows. Maybe. They know. I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm just saying, yeah, there's some things that it, it's strange to me that, uh, I, you know, here's an example of of something that that got me thinking about this. It's not on eschatology per se, but I used to work at a Christian bookstore mm. back in the nineties, uh, 1996 to like 2000. I worked at this bookstore. I was born and, in 92, by the way. Oh, really? Okay. So I was working at a Christian bookstore when you were still a toddler. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but yeah, so this guy started working there and he always wanted to talk to me about tongues. He went to a Pentecostal church and this is nothing, you know, against Pentecostals. It's just, this is what this particular individual, I wouldn't say it's true of all Pentecostals, but, uh, he wanted to talk about tongues every day. And I was like, I'm not really (laughs) interested in talking about tongues every day. Uh, and, and so one day I stopped him. I was like, I'm I'm going to work. And I'm like, I am not interested in talking about tongues today. Uh, you know, (laughs) let's talk about Jesus or something. So anyways, we go to work and I I said to him, I said, Hey, because it was obvious to me that he was prioritizing this over other things. And, you know, even if, you know, just for the sake of argument, we grant that I'm wrong and he's right on that particular issue. I'm thinking, you know, is this really the most, is this really what occupies your thoughts all the time? And so I, I said to him, this was intended to just sort of get him thinking in terms of priorities and what's most important and so forth. I said to him, I said, if I was dying, if you saw me, I got hit by a car and, and I'm laying in the gutter and I'm gasping for air and you have two minutes with me. I said, what would you tell me? So what would you tell me before I passed into eternity? And he said, well, um, uh, and I said, well, I said, would you talk to me about tongues? I said, or would you give me the gospel? I said, would you start telling me what the gospel is? And I said, if so, what would it be? And he's like, well, um, and he kept hemming and hawing. And I'm like, are you serious? You don't have anything right. to say? I've got two minutes, man. I'm about to die. And anyway, so then I thought, okay, I'm going to kickstart him here. I said, okay, so you'd tell me, for example, that God's eternal son, the eternal word came down from heaven and for us men in our salvation took on human flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. I said, you tell me that, right? And then you tell me what he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, what are you talking about? And I said, what do you mean? Wait a minute. What am I talking about? I said, you'd tell me that the sun came down. He goes, Jesus didn't come down from heaven. I said, what? And he said, he goes, Jesus, he goes, Jesus, he was, he was, born of mary i mean he you know he and i'm like what this whole time i'm working with this guy he goes to a pentecostal Mm. church and he told me he was uh, also a youth pastor there and the guy didn't even know who jesus was i thought Mm. i am never again going to assume or take for granted somebody's christianity Mm. i'm going to make sure that people that i talk to if i'm out witnessing and somebody tells me they're a christian i'm going to make sure i ask them if they know the gospel if they know who jesus is and ever since then i was like this guy wanted to shut anything out that I said because I didn't agree with him on tongues. And I'm thinking, so if I start addressing things like this to people that are of that mindset, mm. then I'm not, I might not get an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus, which is far more important. So mm. it's just that kind of thing that weighs on me. Uh, I, I'm not yeah. saying I'll never speak on some of the specifics of eschatology that I tend to avoid. It's just, I keep thinking, I don't want somebody shutting out what I'm telling them about justification. Right. Because I don't hold their particular view of Gog and Magog, right? Yeah. Or their view of the third temple or the red heifer or, you know, where the Ark of the Covenant is or something like that. <laughs> you you talk, tell, sharing that story made me think about uh, a lot of times you can tell pretty quick people's pet doctrines. You know what I mean? And no surprise with Church Christ, it's baptism, right? That's the thing that they're going to talk about a lot. They're going to want to talk four evenings in a row on Acts 238. You know what I mean? And. Give me I did, an axe I, and two thirty eights, and I can take out any. Have you heard that? Yeah. No, I haven't. That's good. I, I used to hear that from Church of Christ people. Give me an axe and two thirty eights. They're talking about axe two thirty eight. <laughs> give me an axe two. Uh, give me an axe and two thirty eights, and I can take out any Christian, you know, or whatever group they're talking about. I've Baptist, actually never heard that. That's good. <laughs> uh, so I deal with hospice care in most Church of Christ, and I mean the the vast majority, ninety five percent or more. If you do not get fully immersed, sorry for my Presby brothers out there, but unless you don't, unless you get fully immersed, I mean, hand sticking out of the water, you're disobeying the gospel in their mind. Okay. I mean, that's the level of legalism we're dealing with here. But as the more and more I talk about this, well, what about the person that I'm interacting with that cannot be fully immersed into water? Right. Deathbed experiences, not deathbed, but, you know, they're going to die really soon. Iron lung. Yeah, well, they didn't obey the gospel, Jeremiah. So I'm like, nope, uh, I refuse. And and then it's like, yes, I'm going to meet them with love and grace, speak the truth and love, all these things. But there is a level of seriousness where they're distorting the gospel so much so where it leaves some people without hope. I recently spoke on the cultish podcast from Apologia, and uh, I make no bones about it, but the Church of Christ is a cult 
in, both um, historically, beginning with Alexander Campbell and the Restorationist Movement, but biblically, they have departed from the gospel of grace, which Paul talks about and anathematizes. And so when they talk about a person is damned because they can't get into water, um, that really upsets me, and I'm going to speak hardcore against it. So for the people that say, well, if you have a desire for a baptism, like early church fathers, or, well, we just trust God's grace. I'm like, look, you're taking, you're trying to make an exception where that's the rule, right? And so I just try to tell people obedience is wonderful, but obedience flows from a transformed, transformed heart of faith in the perfect Savior. And so anyway, all that to say is um, you can start telling, you know, the full preterists, they're going to want to talk about the, the timing indicators. That's their big thing. Everything's interpreted in light of that. Church of Christ, they want to talk about baptism because that's most preeminent. And I would venture to say it's probably what they worship. That's why uh, when I talk to Roman Catholics, it's why do we talk so much about Mary, right? And why does that get your blood boiling in the same conversation where you would talk about the Trinity and Christology? Well, it's because veneration is code for worship. Yeah. In fact, uh, you, you mentioned Mary and it reminds me one thought that I've had, if I, at this point, you know, uh, I wasted a year chasing William and Sam. Now, suddenly they say they want to debate and so forth. And <laughs> Sam said, let's debate whether Mary remained a virgin. I'm thinking, I don't even have any much, I don't have much interest in that. What I would be interested in debating, here's a properly framed debate that mm. actually deals with what I hold to, is belief in Mary's perpetual virginity a mm. de fide doctrine that is Ooh. a doctrine necessary unto salvation because the official position of Rome is that if you knowingly reject this, uh, you reject Rome's official magisterial teaching on this, you're outside of the church. And if they're going to be consistent with their earlier conciliar documents, they have to say that those who are outside the church are lost. But that's mm. the consistent Roman position. They claim they're irreformable, so they, they shouldn't be advocating a different view of those outside the church than what was held before that. At least the Eastern people that I interact with have been more consistent in saying, yeah, we, we say that everybody who's outside our, our piddling little denomination right. You know, is is lost, including babies. Everybody's not baptized. Mm. I mean, they're they're pretty. Mm. You know, they're a lot more consistent than than their Roman Catholic counterparts these days. But, anyways, uh, that I'd be interested in. Uh, does the Bible teach as a defeat a doctrine that Mary's perpetual virginity? Is this something that's requisite unto salvation? Uh, mm. But here's a question before I lose it uh, that you might be able to answer. I know I can't. Breakfast Gun says, "Are y'all familiar with the movement in the Church of Christ?" away from these heresies hmm. so yeah a little bit i can't remember i mean they're still cloaked under the church of christ but they're starting to use instruments uh because you get you got to understand something anthony um legalism attacks itself right so i mean you, you have churches of christ that will anathematize one another if you use multiple cups in communion versus one um if you use instruments or if you clap your hands and are making instrument with your hands well, you're doing a man-made tradition that's not prescribed in Scripture. So a lot of these <clears throat> gatherings, I'll say for the sake of this conversation, are starting to back away from the hard legalism. And I've met some professing Church of Christ that they're just like, look, we are hearing what you're saying about do the doctrine of justification by faith. And we don't think that you're outside the faith. You might be right. Can we still be brothers? And <laughs> Marlon. Uh, <laughs> and so, yes, I've heard um, and I just encourage these people just please don't call yourself Church of Christ anymore uh, because you're really not being the thing that distinguishes you as, quote unquote, the Church of Christ. And a lot of them start end up changing their name, um, Community of Christ, things like that. But, yes, I'm, I'm very much aware and I'm like, praise God. Right. They're moving away from, you know, a false gospel that can't save. Yeah, Shamuz here is a Roman Catholic. He says Catholics who understand the Boston controversy believe in no salvation outside the church. Uh, so there are some Roman Catholics who will be consistent. I think certain set of vacantists are even more consistent. Set of vacantists are those who think that the current pope is not a true pope, uh, that the chair of Peter is vacant. Uh, but people like wouldn't you hate Simon, ha to have to defend the current pope with some of the things that go on and what he says? <laughs> That would just I'd be like, tough. I'd like to debate the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would pay to watch that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, all right. So uh, one thing, um, 
maybe as sort of a way of winding down here and kind of bringing it back to our topic mm -hmm. is I was thinking of, well, there's a couple different things that uh, we could have focused on, I think. Uh, but, well, let me just say this. So, and then get your response. We, we have sort of talked about this, but we haven't really emphasized it. And that's the fact that faith is the instrumental means mm. for receiving justification. We have mentioned faith, of course. We talked about Abraham's faith. We've seen it in contrast to works. Uh, the Gospels are replete with references to faith as the, the way of, of taking hold of Christ, of receiving forgiveness and so forth. You even have that pregnant phrase in uh, Luke 8 where Jairus uh, is told, do not be afraid any longer, only believe, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing is a constant refrain in the Gospels. It's not just Pauline. It's, it's throughout the, the Gospels. And, and it's obvious, I think a lot of people are missing the point in some of the Gospel stories when th they think that when they read a story like the rich young ruler, where he comes up to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Uh, or other stories, uh, they're, they're, they're looking at what's really the setup to the problem as though it were the answer. Uh, the answer that's being given over and over again is believing. Th there's these pointed contrasts with those who believe uh, in contrast to these others who don't. And they're the ones who are extolled, right, for their great faith and all this kind of thing. The reason the, the rich young ruler walks away sad is there's no mention there of his faith, right? It's, a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's other things. But um, what do Church of Christ people say? Maybe mm. you could tell me. Yeah. Uh, how do they deal with the very clear emphasis on faith in in Scripture? And maybe I'll just leave it broad like that, so you can you can determine how. Specific <clears throat> well, you want there's to be. a couple of different answers you could get uh, because they have a five step formula, right? You gotta you gotta hear the word, you gotta believe, you gotta repent, you gotta confess got to be baptized, right? Uh, so when they're looking at the Gospels, they're going to remind you this Jesus is under the law. Don't forget that. And when Jesus forgives sin on the basis of faith, they'll just say, well, Jesus is the God man. He can forgive sin. And my, my critique is, well, he's not an unjust judge, right? We see a consistency of how um, the just judge of all the earth forgives sin. It's on the basis of faith. So what they'll try to do, is try to say, well, faith is a work that you're doing. So works is not divorced from that. There's a conflation of categories. But then um, I, I think this is a stronger argument. It fails at the end of the day. But like the woman that reached out and touched the hem of Jesus's garment, they would say, see, she's doing a work according to your definition, Jeremiah. But was that a meritorious work? <laughs> and I say, okay, let, let's unpack these examples because the one you mentioned earlier i'm like it was her faith that resulted in healing right it wasn't something that she was able to get up and do but but yeah jesus so many different examples it's pointing back to christ a lot of times jesus can heal physically which shows the physical or spiritual reality that he can forgive sin right and so i would say under a um, synergistic worldview yes she was receiving her due under this model that, yeah, she was distinguished from the crowd. She was smarter than the most, most people to figure out who Jesus was. If I touch him, then I'm going to get something in return. I'm saying, praise God. That's not the actual world that we live in. God was um, graciously working in her, drawing her to the Savior by faith, right? And so we see a mere demonstration of her faith that resulted in a physical healing. That's not the paradigm of justification, but what we can glean from that is, yeah, we can we can see what uh, living faith does, right? And so um, you have to remind them of that context. I want to mention another story um, account in Luke chapter five with the paralytic. Um, my right hand man, Adam Carmichael, over here. We spent some time on my show unpacking this because in the Church of Christ's mind, you got to do something. Acts two thirty eight. Um, they're asking, "What must we do?" Not just sit there. I mean, that's the type of conversations I have to have with this. And I'm like, okay, Luke 5, um, the paralytic, Jesus says he saw their faith, 
right? And if you if you measure this with Matthew chapter 9, Jesus says to the paralytic, man, your sins are forgiven you. And so my question to the Church of Christ, that I don't ever hear an answer other than, well, faith is a work. <clears throat> and we, it devolves into that. But I'm just saying, what works did the paralytic do before he picked up his bed and walked, right? What works did he do when Jesus said, man, your sins are forgiven you? Well, they're in a pickle because he's a paralytic. He literally can't do anything. And they say, but yeah, he saw their works. That means he um, he saw their faith. That means he saw their works. No, no, Jesus looks past the works. He sees the pistis. So yeah, there was a collective group of faith, and we can see that faith being demonstrated with the friends. But Jesus looked past the works and saw the heart. That's why later in the context, um, the, the Pharisees were getting mad and accusing him of all these things. But it says, Jesus perceiving their thoughts, right? What well, was true on the inside. I'm like, Jesus saw their heart of faith, the disposition of their heart. But that's a classic example where literally the man only had faith. He could not do any works, and he was forgiven on that basis. Now, taking this over to the uh, debate with Rome in the East, mm -hmm. I read this the other day. I don't know if you saw my recent show that I did. I was doing it for ministry to Muslims, but it appeared on their channel and on my channel, so you can watch it here okay. or there but it was on the deity of christ and the gospel from mark chapter two and what i was doing was taking this incident of the paralytic man mm. and showing from this context the deity of christ mm. because jesus exercises an exclusively divine prerogative mm. and i go into the old testament foundation for that and the fact that mark is clearly situating it in this context this the idea of the pharisees because some people like to dismiss it and say the Pharisees were wrong. Oh, not only God can forgive sins. And by the way, note how Rome in the East, in principle, undermined this argument for the deity of Christ, which Mark is clearly trying to make by ascribing this prerogative to others. Mm. Uh, but Scripture says it belongs to God alone in this magisterial sense. Uh, anyways, Jesus' deity is demonstrated here, but also the nature of the gospel. Here is, in their very presence, the one who's going to die for sin, the one who has been ordained to that end, and he is extending forgiveness to this man solely on the ground of faith, right? Or mm. not on the ground, but through faith. And uh, But Rome and the East both reject this as a Protestant interpretation, which I think, again, is evident from the text for the reasons you've given. Uh, but they want to say that this is an innovation. So here's a, here's a quote that I read on this. This comes from Hilary of Potier, the uh, one I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is from his commentary on Matthew's version of this account. So it's the mm -hmm. paralytic man. It's the same account, it, but Matthew's version of it. But here's, here's what he says. He says, a pattern of truth is followed in these words, even as an image of the future is fulfilled in the words. It disturbed the scribes that sin was forgiven by a man, for they considered that Jesus Christ was only a man mm. and that he forgave sin for which the law was not able to grant absolution since faith alone justifies. And then he goes on. And this is not a one-off, by the way. If, if anyone will pick up his commentary on Matthew's gospel, it's out there. It, it's not hard to get. Pick up his commentary over and over again. He re repeatedly interprets certain things in the gospels as people being justified through faith alone. This is why I think it was very interesting and enlightening in my cross ex of Seraphim, how he wanted to, you know, him and Ha there. I, I imagine you noticed this, right? Some people were upset that I was stopping him because the, the thing is, you've got limited time in a cross ex, right? And if a person's not going to answer your questions, you need to move on or you need right. to press them to answer it. Otherwise, they're just wasting your time. Well, it was I very explain the same thing to people. Yeah. I mean, and, and the other thing is, it's kind of like, um, you know, I love watching this judge on television, uh, the People's Court, because one of the things she notices that I've noticed is when somebody asks a very clear and pointed question and then the other person says, what, come again? You know, that's often a stole tactic. They don't like the question and they don't necessarily have a quick answer. So they're trying mm. to stall their their wheels are going and. You know, sometimes people don't under, understand you. That's, you know, fair enough. But there are a lot of times when you know they're just stalling. And so anyways, the, the question is very simple, right? How is this man justified? On what basis were his sins forgiven? Was it because of faith or something else? And 
when I'm not getting an answer to that, when it's very easy, I know there's a problem. <laughs> and the very easy answer is faith alone. Now, they want to say, oh, well, whenever the fathers use this phrase, they mean it in a way different than you do. Well, why couldn't he give that very different answer? I mean, why couldn't he answer it saying faith alone then? Why, why did it have to be, you know, if there's this easy alternative way of understanding that, you know, I could say exactly what he says. I don't have to him and haw. Faith alone. Right. But Anthony, you, you yeah. haven't read James chapter two that mentions <laughs> the phrase. I will faith say, only. yeah, we'll say something about that in one second. But uh, <laughs> the other thing is, so read that commentary. Even the uh, D.H. Williams, who does the introduction to it, points out that it's very clear that he holds to the Pauline ver view of justification, sola fide. Uh, and it's all throughout his commentary on Matthew. But anyways, uh, sola fide in it, it, one thing that's very interesting. There's an article, actually, I think the guy's a Roman Catholic who wrote it, but he makes this very interesting observation about a, a curious fact. I, I've just given an example of one father who used the phrase faith alone in hmm. connection with justification, right? Now, set aside what that phrase means, okay? They're going to pretend it can mean something else that's magically consistent with Rome in the East neither of whom has any official statement in their confessional document saying it's faith alone under some other meaning of that. You know, it, they just flat out reject it. Anyways, set aside whatever that possibly means. It's clear that certain fathers use this phrase, right? Victorinus. I just gave one. There's one, another one you've mentioned before. Who? Victorinus. Oh, yeah, yeah. I could give so many examples. I mean, and I have them at my fingertips. I, I have example after example. Um, but... Set that aside for a moment. Why do none of these fathers think that they have to stop and explain how their words are not inconsistent with James 2.24? Doesn't that <laughs> strike you as problematic? Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Okay. But if they're using a phrase that James really negates, then you'd think that at some point they'd say, this doesn't contradict what James says, because here's what we mean when we use this phrase, and here's what James meant when he uses this phrase. They don't ever, not once, they never once try to explain how they can use this phrase without contradicting hmm. what James says. This suggests something. Okay, this is the sort of thing that I recommend to people. You know, when you see this sort of thing, it's a it's a clue that maybe, maybe there's something here to be discovered. Well, this is true not only of Greek speaking fathers, but also of the Latin speaking fathers. And uh, so this is further interesting. You know, why why is it that Greek speaking fathers have no problem with it? Latin speaking fathers have no problem with it. What's interesting is when you look at the actual Greek phrase, and I, I don't know why the, the translations botch it so often here, but when you look at the Greek phrase, the word translated alone is not hmm. an adjective modifying faith. It simply is not. It's grammatically impossible to render it that way. It is not the Protestant slogan that James is negating. Okay. It's not an adjective. Look at any interlinear. I don't need to look mm. at an interlinear, but for those that do look at it, it is not an adjective. And that's what it must be if you're going to say it contradicts what these fathers meant or what Protestants mean. It simply isn't. The same thing is true when you look at the Latin translation. When you look at Jerome's Latin translation, he rightly recognizes that it's not an adjective modifying faith. Now, I don't have time to unpack all the implications of this, but the simple fact is that James is not negating what Protestants are affirming, right. what Paul affirms, what Hilary of Poitiers affirmed, what Victorinus affirmed, what Cyril of Alexandria, Basil the Great, and all these others affirm. Uh, so that that's, first of all, I mean, the, uh, and the main point that I... Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, my quick response, is it James 2, 24, around in there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I say, read the whole verse because he starts off by saying, you see, right? Mm -hmm. So like you've taught on many times, um, you see this person to person interaction, uh, this, this demonstrate your faith to me back in verse 18. That's the continued context. And the faith that's being negated is not a firm trust, but a mere said faith that you look earlier in the context. And so I've had the, the best time of just showing people literally verse by verse, the context, because I've noticed these other positions they jump off uh james's argument at some point in the dialogue um i've had recently a church christ say okay 
Uh, Because they'll ask me, well, how how is Abraham justified before man? Man, we go back to Genesis 22 and all before we go through that. We can go the distance, right? Well, how did Rahab show her faith? Because she hid the men. I'm like, for once, the same application that Christians are reading and the Jews of old. But what about the two men that she hid? They are two witnesses, right? The truth of a matter is, is justified on the basis of two or three witnesses, as the law would later bring out. But it's like, However we want to do this dance, true saving faith will make itself known. Hebrews 11 is built on the thesis verse of Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. And so Romans 1 kind of brings out that fact too. Um, but yeah, it sounds like me and you have fought very similar battles when it comes <laughs> to James chapter. I think someone in the chat was just saying, the apologetic dog doesn't even know that James 2 contradicts him. I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it, it's not surprising that it would come up uh, – Roberts and Jenis years ago mm. wrote a book, Not by Faith Alone. And the title of the book, this is why it's so astounding. The title of the book is taken from James 2.24, the mistranslation of James 2.24. <laughs> and throughout the book, he constantly brings up James 2.24. He even brings it up at times when it seems his back is against the wall. In other words, it's his escape clause. Yeah. Anytime he doesn't know how to deal with a verse, he brings up this one. And it's, it's like a, a, a drum beat. One of the things that I, I want to do a video on this. I have to think through it more, but it, it has to do with propaganda techniques. And, and that's where people, I, I kind of think of it like, you know, the, uh, I'm not a like Star Wars nerd for those that are used to, you know, but I, I, I liked Star Wars, but uh, you know, the, the whole um, Jedi mind trick, right? Remember how, uh, it, it supposedly works, but not on people who are tough minded. Right. So job of the hut was tough minded, but this, uh, you know, other people that succumb to it aren't mm -hmm. propaganda techniques work on people that aren't tough minded. Mm -hmm. And one propaganda technique is constantly repeating something. People mm -hmm. hear something over and over and over again. And it's hard to overcome that for somebody that's come under the, the power of that. It's hard to overcome that. So if I quote a father, uh, numerous Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox people have been, had it beaten into their heads. We believe what the fathers taught. So you can't possibly be accurately representing the fathers, right? That's a, it's a mantra in their ears. They're hearing, right. we are the people of the fathers. And so I realize the same thing is true though. When you, it comes to a passage like James two twenty four. they have heard over and over again that this refutes the Protestant doctrine. This is as St. Genis says in his book, Rome's calling card. He says, this is our calling card. This this is what we use as the great defeater of, of Protestantism. And so I find it uh, 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 so astounding that it, it nobody seems to have taken a moment to look at the Greek text here. Mm -hmm. And it's not that St. Genis doesn't know Greek. St. Genis was trained at Westminster. He knows Greek, uh, but he apparently never looked at it, at least not carefully enough in Greek. And anyways, I got a whole article I'm working on. Uh, on yeah. that issue but uh i was wanting to speak real quick to kind of my side of things with the church of christ because this is kind of their calling card as well and when i asked the question you know you know wh who is justification before i mean that's why my debate was um essentially before god because i am wanting to go to romans 4 to talk about a true living faith what that looks like but a lot of them will say jeremiah our baptism is showing god that our faith is real um, a faith that works and I try to encourage people to think about what they're saying. Are, are they believing in an omniscient being who knows all things? He knows the moment um, that you have faith, or does he need to learn when that faith works a particular action like baptism? And so that's something else that's at stake is, are we going to be consistent with who God is and then with, with who man is in light of that? Does he need to see that particular work uh, manifested in order for him to know that it's real. Well, that's absurd. God tests the heart. God knows beforehand. And so, and yeah, we never go to James 2.10. No, he, he's saying they don't. Um, <laughs> okay. James 2.10, uh, right? uh, if you stumble at one point of the law, you've shattered the whole thing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's obviously problematic for those that are, you, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that they're never taking into account is this, is this point when they, it's like they. this is why I wanted to start by talking about God as holy, righteous, just mm. and the law of God and the requirement of perfection, that sort of thing, because it's like they, they think the gospel is God has relaxed his standards, right? God has now made it easier to get into heaven by works. 
that's the way some groups and some individuals seem to be thinking. I'm not saying everyone makes this sort of error, but there is this idea that you know we're safe by works, though none of none of them would say that they perfectly keep God's law. But that's a problem. If you're saved by works, then you have to keep the whole law. And if you want to say, well, no, because Christ's righteousness or Christ's mm. uh, atonement, you know, covers our sins. Well. <laughs> Uh, it, now you're on our platform, right? Mm. It, it's not both and, it's it's either or. It's either mm. Christ is your Savior or you are your Savior. Scripture doesn't allow you to mix these two things. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, if, if you stumble in one point, then you've you've broken the whole thing. It's the same point Paul makes in Galatians when he says, right. uh, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do all things that are written in the book of the law. Note how comprehensive that is, by the way. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do mm -hmm. all things written in the book of the law so everyone is cursed of whom this is the case who doesn't continue so it's not just doing it one day or a week or a year or most of your life it's continual doing it all the time and everything not just the main things not just a lot of things but everything cursed is everyone who does not continue to do all things written in the book of the law and the only alternative to that is to be in christ mm. who has provided atonement so i don't know do you uh have any other issues that you think i didn't cover that you want to address um well i know we are winding down um i do i, I did want to get your thoughts on this i know um this in in the debate that i had first corinthians six eleven was brought up because they're pushing for water baptism is not a work um, and I'm like, literally by definition, you're participating in some degree in your baptism. It is something that you bring to the table. And obviously being reformed, we, we see God monergistically working out all things together after the counsel of his will. And I've also taught that that doesn't negate our perspective and our life of working out our salvation and fear and trembling in our sanctification. I would remind somebody, but this verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, was brought up. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. Now, I know that maybe not all um, <clears throat> Protestants would, would see this the same way. My initial thought was, look what, what Paul is telling um, his audience. You've been saved by the grace of God. Um, you are not going to inherit the the kingdom of God from an earthly standpoint and living this debauched life, but you were saved by grace. <clears throat> and then I've heard Roman Catholics say, well, sanctification comes first before justification. Well, earlier in chapter one, he talks about how we were sanctified in Jesus Christ. We've been positionally set apart from the world, and then it's qualified by justification. So we're over here like there's there's no problem there. So in my debate, the question was, well, if you think this is talking about more of regeneration and monergism, um, then why is it written in the middle voice? And so my initial response was because it doesn't negate our perspective. And the reason why I think it's really getting into regeneration is because it's qualified by the Spirit of God. It reminds me a lot of Titus 3.5. And so did you want to speak to maybe how you handle this verse and the objection that says, well, if it's in the middle voice, well, then how can this be monergism? <laughs> well, here, here's the, the question I would throw back at them. <laughs> I actually think this verse clearly decimates them. Mm. It says, such were some of you, but you were washed. It is accurate to say this is an aorist indicative middle and if they want to say this refers to baptism, note that it cannot possibly, therefore, be justification. It's not justifying because Paul distinguishes this washing from sanctification, that setting apart that takes place at the beginning of the Christian life, and from justification. He says, you were washed, aorist middle, you were sanctified, now it's aorist passive, so that shows that sanctification is not the same thing as this washing that's in view here. But then he goes on to say, you were justified, which is another error is passive, not a middle. So washing here is not justification. 
I, I think they're bringing the rope to their own hanging when they appeal to this verse. Right. So I'm saying even if you want to say that the washing here is baptism, it is decidedly not justification. I've thought about this, too, along with your defining terms and showing the distinctions here. But if you're saying that the 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 middle voice is kind of it's all about you doing something. And if you're talking about this being water baptism, well, then you, you can't merely say then I, I don't do anything in my baptism. I'm merely passive, not according to their own standard. Does that make sense? So they're, they're talking about their participation within water baptism. I'm like, oh, you're back at square one trying to get out of this being a work that you do. Yeah, and besides that, the middle voice doesn't necessitate that the person himself is doing something. That's just not true. The idea is that this has some sense of self-interest, right? Mm. This action has something to do with the self-interest. I'm trying to think of how to put it in ways that we don't normally think in English. You know, you have this, and in, in Greek, you have the active voice, meaning the person's doing it. You have a passive voice, which doesn't focus on the agent. It just focuses on the event. It's something that's happening to a person. And this could be because God is doing it or whatever, but the, the, the agent is not in view. The middle voice expresses that this is something done with a kind of self-interest. It, mm. it's, it's something that has interest towards the individual. It doesn't Paul's necessarily saying mean your interests have changed, right? This is worse. Some of you, right? Yeah. But something has happened in your life. Yeah. I, so I think, I mean, the quick answer that I would give to this is the one that I gave that it, it's, it's, it decidedly distinguishes it from sanctification and justification. So whatever you want to say that is whether baptism or something else, it is in justification. And mm, therefore, if it is baptism, <laughs> baits over, you know, didn't help, yeah, it didn't help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, I hope you have enjoyed. Oh, wait, there's one other super chat here. I better get uh, Mason says asking a Baptist and Presbyte uh, Presbyterian infants that were baptized. They want to start trouble <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, the when they grow up and profess. Do we baptize again? And what's the history on this? Well, so if you're at you now, I can give you Jeremiah's answer. Don't baptize babies. Now, my my answer is that you would no more rebaptize a child than somebody would have recircumcised a child that grew up in belief. Uh, the, 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 the official Presbyterian view is that uh, uh, look at you guys looking at each other. None of that <laughs> um, it, it is that we accept the validity of a person's baptism. We don't believe baptism saves. So it's not, you know, what saves is faith and baptism is a sign and seal of faith if a person doesn't have faith then baptism is uh you know actually condemns them if anything right it, it speaks against them uh and so they, they have to believe right uh baptism or no baptism those who don't believe will be damned if i can borrow a line from your debate uh i think it was wasn't it spurgeon who uh i think i remember reading a sermon of spurgeon's on mark 16 Mm. Uh, where he kept emphasizing whether you believe or, or uh, whether you're baptized or not, he who does not believe shall be damned. And he just kept hammering that. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. I already gave your answer that way. You don't have <laughs> That's to. true. I was like, well, this is your show. And Anthony's <laughs> like the only Presbyterian that I would not want to debate on this, this topic. Uh, but what I love is you and I have so much unity. Like we can come on and talk about justification by faith alone that I try to encourage my Southern Baptist brothers, it's okay to have strong fellowship with Presbyterians. I mean, we, we have the same gospel of grace. Now, I think you and I would have so much more in common than a lot of professing Baptists. So the baptism thing, I tell people, is very important, um, but there's room for charity and disagreement for how we, we try to come together to understand these things. Obviously, I love Dr. James White. I just point people to a lot of his debates and teaching series. He says a lot better than I can. Um, I recently debated a Lutheran, of all people, uh, on their understanding of baptism. And what, what kind of gets Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists in this conversation is our differing views of the covenant, um, how that works out. And to me, I just I love the ongoing discussion. Um, something that I have nothing but just love and respect for for Presbyterians in 
um, contrast to Lutherans is they hold to baptismal regeneration and sola fide. And I just think that is really hard to do. But I think when you appeal to infants being baptized, what I can't do is try to say, well, they were doing something of their own volition, right? I, I actually agree that they were not doing anything in favor of, like I, I can see the gospel picture, pictured with an infant. And so I've enjoyed that ongoing um, just understanding from the Presbyterian um, and then distinguished from the Lutheran side. Um, and so my, my thought is we have to just talk about the covenant, the, the nature of the new covenant in Christ. And that's where the debate is had. But Church of Christ, I think they've totally made baptism into a work that they have to participate in because they do believe you have to be fully submerged that you have to get up and walk into the baptism. And if you don't, then you're disobeying the gospel. So I, I think there's a lot of unity that you and I share. I tell people I loved the camaraderie between John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul. Uh, I think they modeled mm -hmm. that very well back in the day. One question as we're closing out uh, that occurred to me that I was thinking about before, but this brings it back up again. There's an old saying, you know, an elephant once it gets its nose in the door, isn't going to be content until it comes all the way in. Right? <laughs> if it gets a little bit of that trunk in there, it's coming in and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Right. In my mind, this idea on the part of the church of Christ is kind of mm. a Trojan horse. I can't imagine it really stops there with baptism. So, I, I mean, I realize that in terms of what they want to say, to some extent, they're probably more comfortable trying to defend baptismal works in justification but uh do they really stop at that or is it really the case hmm. that uh, uh, you know i mean i'm not saying that's not bad enough i'm just saying are is it like a, a proverbial case of the elephant getting all the way 100%. in do they turn so around and also here's struggle the, here's the trojan way? horse five-step formula in order to be saved is what they will say but they don't tell you uh, the things that come later so they say you got to hear the word you got to believe, you have to repent, you have to confess, and you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. Mark 16, 16. And all I do is just say, so if, well, for one, that's not all five steps, but if I do these steps, are you saying that I will be saved? Because what I'm about to say is I've done those things. <laughs> oh, well, there's a sixth step where you got to be a part of our church of Christ. We're, we're the church of Christ, by the way. I don't know if you read Romans 16, 16 the churches of Christ. And I'm like, you're just begging the question. That's just talking about the nature of the church. It's Christ's church. It's the Lord's church. And so that's, that's the thing. And it's the restorationist movement. Uh, the restorationist people say, you got to be a part of our group. And so that's, that's hidden step number six. And then a hidden step number seven is you have to live a holy life. And if you don't repent when you sin, then you will lose your salvation. And so I, I liked what you said. I mean, there's so much more that they're not telling you up front that you got to be a part of their church and you have to live a holy life. And that gets into a world of problems, too, because what if you don't repent when you didn't know you sinned? Well, all the sins that you, you know about. Well, what about the sins that you don't know about? Does God just wink at sin? Um, so there's so many implications. But, uh, but I really do think it's legalism to the highest order, like it's modern day Phariseeism. Hmm. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, one quick thing here. Miles asks if I would put together stuff for resources on justification. Absolutely. I will. I will. Uh, I don't know the timetable exactly, but I've got oodles and boodles of stuff. In fact, some of it is sitting right here. Right within here. arm's reach yes indeed <laughs> this is my justification section for those that don't know um oh, but uh yeah so i will be doing that i'm just the, uh, let me tell you some of what i've i've been doing so that you can anticipate it so you guys can drool so the apologetic dog can drool no. <laughs> um so one thing i've done is i've gathered up all these quotes from the fathers just alphabetically right so mm. starting with let's say ambrose and going all the way down to victorinus you know and every father in between in the alphabet i can't think of one with the z um but uh so all of their stuff and i'm by no means finished i'm not pretending to have read every single thing that every father has written but i've read a good 
large amount of patristic stuff. And then what I've done is I've also taken the same material and I've broken it down in terms of commentary on verses. Hmm. So if you're looking for how did the fathers interpret Romans 1, 16 and 17, you know, and I, uh, ones that are relevant. That's going to be so the, helpful. Yeah, there, there's then, a book. I'm sure you've read it. It's called Long Before Luther. And it gets into a lot of the patristics that understood imputation, the way that the Protestants do, a hard distinction between justification and sanctification and mm -hmm. faith alone. Uh, I mean, so many wonderful things that we're just saying, yeah, this is a, this is a historic uh, faith, not something that was innovative at the Reformation. Well, I can tell you that what I've got in the works is more comprehensive mm. than anything I've seen out there. I've hey, seen that. Yeah. I've seen Odin's Justification Reader and all these other ones. They don't even come close to the amount of material that's out there. So then I've got, according to just alphabetically, so if you want to know what does a father say on this topic, you can look at all his quotations. And obviously, you want to really look at the context of these things, but it gives you a flavor for mm. what they're saying. And then I've broken it down according to verses, and then I'm breaking it down topically, and I've constantly mm. been adding to all this. So it's by no means complete, but it is quite extensive. So that's some of the stuff that you can be looking forward to. And then... Um, Can't wait. Uh, be good. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that was from Miles. All right, folks. Well, I thank you. I thank uh, Jeremiah for coming on, being my first guest. And I think it went better than I expected. I thought I was going to fumble because I'm just not, there's some things I'm just not good at and I wasn't sure I was going to do okay. I'm not pretending I did great, but I, I wasn't sure I was going to do okay trying to host a, a uh, interview, dialogue, whatever. Uh, but I think it went great. I enjoyed it. I had a blast. <laughs> I hope you have me back on. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, so I hope people will check out Jeremiah's channel, The Apologetic Dog. I do have it linked in the description box. Uh, otherwise, it's easy to look up. Uh, again, thank you all for listening. I do hope this was a blessing. And above all else, I hope that your strength or your faith in Christ has been mm -hmm. uh, strengthened. So until next time, God bless. And uh, Jeremiah, if you would stick around and we'll, uh, we'll connect again behind the scenes. Absolutely. trust God's word alone where his perfect will is known our traditions shift like sand while his truth forever stands we will live by faith alone clothed in merit not our own all we claim is Jesus Christ and His finished sacrifice. Glory be, glory be to God alone. Through the church He redeemed and made His own. Has freed us, He will keep us till we're safely home. Glory be, glory be to God.